moving on to a different topic. And I'm just waiting for this to go live. I'm watching my little monitor over here to see when everybody sees me. I'm hoping everybody will see me soon. And it looks like we're starting live now. So something may be coming on. Let's see. Come on. Come live. Does anybody see me yet? Looks like we've got good. Okay. Oh my goodness. I think I have... Um, Wow, I didn't know that, that there are actual subtitles on my video right now. That's crazy. Let's see here. And people aren't seeing me yet, so there. Hopefully now you will see me. I should pop on like all surprised. Oh, come on. My face should come up. My body should come in. Just a second. I didn't end up finalizing the green screen and putting it on the main program, so <laughs> that's why I'm a ghost. <laughs> I'm still waiting for it to come up. Come on, guys. Uh, there I am. Okay. <laughs> it's always kind of a trick getting this going, you know. I, I, there's, it, there's never a dull day. Let me put it that way. There's just all these buttons I have to push, and everything needs to be just perfect. I was running out to, uh, just, just for a little personal note, I was actually running out to CVS, which is a drugstore. For those of you who are not familiar with West Coast uh, stores, this is like a Walgreens or a, just a normal, um, you know, drugstore to get some batteries because my my husband now uses um, uses my rig for teaching online classes so he's drained all the batteries and <laughs> last minute I had to go out and get new ones because it was like oh no I've got no batteries so it was like 15 minutes before showtime I had to I was driving like 90 miles an hour not really but it was it was a little hectic so if you see little beads of sweat <laughs> dripping down my face that's why Anyway, okay, so enough of that. So can you guys hear me okay? Um, hello from the UK. I see, I see Tim, I see Gary, I see Dennis, I see uh, Jose, I see Yardley, I see uh, Tech Splash, Splash Co. Installer. Um, thank you. Oh, Ben, Ben is watching. Oh, that's interesting. Please don't start fights, please. Ben is, ben is fringe. We've got mainstream science people on this, and, we, and now it looks like we've got fringe people here too, so... No fights, people. No fights. Everybody play nice. Uh, I don't want to see fights in the chat today, okay? Uh, I want to see I want to see people ready to, to continue the learning. Um, we are all in this together. So uh, I appreciate everybody who joins, and um, this should be a lot of fun. We are beginning to get from Mexico. Hey, great. We are beginning to get into the... Um, into the final part of looking at radiation storms, and I'm going to talk about a few of the events today that uh, that have really rattled our our whole perspective, and really should have. To be honest, I'm going to pull a couple events together. Uh, one I had talked about in I think two courses ago, in the very first part of this uh, this particular you know the first part of this particular um, mini course uh, series. And then I'm going to pull it together with something else that I haven't talked about for quite some time. I actually talked about it when I was talking about Carrington events. And it really kind of, when I slam the two things together, it really ends up making you kind of go, whoa, wow. We, our timeline, our historical timeline of space weather is really radically different than what it could have been. And like I said, about midway through the course, you'll see why. And uh, it ended up making a very interesting astrosociology question that I asked on my midterm for my Millersville students. Um, who have all now graduated, uh, they've, they've done very, very well. So uh, I'm excited to see a few of them back this upcoming year for the, for, for the certificate program that we're working on together. Um, at any rate, let me not get too far into that. Uh, let me also say thank you to Jerry. Uh, Jerry Ryan is once again monitoring the chat, and if my, um, if my mic goes down or anything like that, uh, he has access to me. Um, so several others of you do too, so if Jerry happens to not be able to get a hold of me if something goes wrong, those of you who have my cell phone number, please give me a call. I'll keep this on uh, because, remember, I do all this on my own, and so I need all the help I can get. <laughs> okay, so everything looks good. I see five by five. Everything, everybody hears. Had to switch YouTube from Patreon to Post. Okay. Well, that Keith had to switch. Really? Okay. Um, okay, understood. I will be monitoring the Patreon feed if you guys have questions on Patreon for all my VIPs and all my mini course people. Um, but I also will obviously be monitoring the chat here too, so I will be checking both. Anyway, uh, 
Behind me are all the people who have helped make this possible. And I know that some of you, if I can step to the correct side, I know that some of you uh, will not see your names here yet. Uh, I have to update this for, for May and the end of April. I have not been able to do that since the last time. So um, my VIPs, I adore you. We get together once a month and talk about all sorts of things. My VIPs are the whole reason why I'm doing the whole Millersville thing. They've helped me steer this ship and really t have kept me on course, letting me know exactly what the community needs. They're from all walks of life. They're all space weather users and, and stakeholders. And they keep me on the straight and narrow and help me stay focused into th the realm of creating this field of space weather broadcasting instead of getting kind of pulled back into the academic realm where a lot of my, my colleagues are. And I, I just don't think that's good for, for the community that we need to continue building and for the direction that we're going as a spacefaring race. So my VIPs, if you want to help steer the ship, please feel free to join. I've got a couple new people that are coming on board this month, and I'm super excited about it. And we're going to be having a meeting, I think, um, probably within the next week or so. Anyway, and then on top of that, I have, of course, all the mini course patrons. Thanks to all of you. You have helped design the content. Tell me where you want me to go, what you want me to, to look into, and what questions you need answered. And if it weren't for you guys, I would never even be doing any of these mini courses. They just wouldn't be possible. So again, thank you so much for all of this, your, your, your generosity and your encouragement over the you know, last few years that we've been doing this. Okay, um, It means the world to me. So with that, is there any, anything that I need to worry about um, getting started? Everybody can hear me OK. Everybody can see me OK. I'm looking at the chat. Um, be sure to post questions. Uh, if I don't see them, don't be offended. If I don't answer them, don't be offended. Just post them again. <laughs> I mean, this stuff goes at the speed of sound and the speed, you know, I, I don't have the chance to, to really catch all the questions when I go back over the mini courses, because uh, I do review some of them on YouTube, at least bits and pieces. I do see that I miss a lot of questions, and I do apologize for that uh, in advance. So just keep posting, and uh, I will take breaks during the middle of the course, uh, you know, probably several times during the course, to uh, you know catch up on questions and uh, try to clarify things that may not be super clear. Okay, so good. Every everybody says audio is fine. Five by nine. Thank you so much. By chance, are you a ham radio operator? If you're asking me, yes, I am a ham radio operator. I've got my technician's license, uh, WX6SWW. So um, I am not on the bands yet. I will probably start getting on the bands. Uh, as Solar Cycle 25 ramps up, because otherwise I'm going to be inundated with questions like, when is the new Solar Cycle going to start? <laughs> I really, I really have, you know, I, I don't have any better answer than you guys. It's beginning to start. It's trying to start. It's it's up and down and up and down. There's two hemispheres of the sun that aren't really in concert right now magnetically. They they're they're kind of. The northern hemisphere is lagging the southern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere has wanted to start the new cycle for probably more than a year now. And the northern hemisphere is just going, no, I ain't feeling it. I'm just not feeling it yet. So we've got to wait till the northern hemisphere gets in the mood. And I don't know how to do that. I've played a violin. I've romanced it. I've given the northern hemisphere roses. And it, it just, no, nothing's, nothing's working. <laughs> anyway, so we just kind of keep hanging in there. But it is coming. So. Uh, Okay, let me, might, I might as well get started. I've kind of farted around long enough here. Uh, this is a chart that I always show at the beginning of the courses just to remind you that there are basically four types of space weather that we care about affecting Earth. Okay, we have already done, well, essentially three of these. We've done the solar, the, the, uh, solar flares that you see here, the solar storms, which are coronal mass ejections that have come out. We've done like something like three courses on solar flares, three courses on coronal mass ejections, those solar storms, and now we're working on the third course of the solar radiation storms. And I'll go ahead and play the solar radiation storms. So if this is your first time catching solar radiation storm course, um, there are two other parts you're missing. And I will review a tiny bit of it just to get us, kind of remind us of where we've been and where we are going. And then I will talk about other sources of solar radiation storms than the sun. Okay, now you're looking at solar sources. These are actually coronal mass ejections that are being blown off, solar storms that are being blown off into the solar wind by the sun. And you'll see a blizzard here very shortly. It's coming. Ready? One, two, three. Where are you? Come on. Bzzz, right there. There you go. That massive thing 
That is a solar radiation storm. You'll see another one uh, here in just a second. Actually, I think we just already had it. I gotta pay attention to which screen I'm looking at. There's another one right there. Um, these solar radiation storms, what, they're, what you're seeing are, are particles, are energetic particles that are, have, are basically at relativistic speeds. And they're actually hitting the CCD of the camera in, in this particular, um, this one? Let's see, is this way? Yeah. Uh, this is uh, the Lasco imager, the, or the, the cor <laughs> coronagraph on SOHO named Lasco, and it uses a CCD. And really what it's looking for is Thomson scattering, uh, basically electron scattering white light. And so it's sensitive to particles that hit the actual detector, and as they go through the detector, they cause streaks. If they're really super energetic, these particles can go right through the detector and, all, and even out to the other side. And those are the streaks of light that you see. Both solar radiation storms, like what you just saw, and uh, cosmic rays actually cause these streaks all the time. As a matter of fact, if you go look at movies uh, from from the chronograph on stereo or the chronograph on, you know, the Lasco chronograph from Soho, at any one time you might see on any of the images or something, you'll see little streaks. Those are typically galactic cosmic rays, which I will talk about shortly. Uh, and of course, you get the big blizzards, like what I just showed there, during solar radiation storms. And that's because you get this massive uh, amount of flux. And all of that, those details are in the prior two courses, okay? Now, the one thing we haven't talked about is coronal holes and the fast solar wind. I will be talking about that in the next part of the series, but not today. So let's talk a little bit more about space radiation. Okay, there are basically three types that we worry about in our solar system. Okay, there may be others elsewhere, but for, for them all practical purposes, we have to worry about galactic cosmic ray radiation. Okay, there's both anomalous and, well, there's galactic cosmic ray and anomalous uh, cosmic radiation. But this is like a soup. When it gets to our solar system, it's very much uh, what we call, it's basically bathing. We're bathing in it. Okay, it's not the same as what comes from our star. Uh, because the stuff that comes from our star is more like a laser beam or a flashlight. It shines at us in a particular way. This galactic cosmic ray radiation, on the other hand, is what we call omnidirectional. It comes in from all angles, it's everywhere. Okay, And you'll see maybe a little bit in this course, I'll talk a little bit about how that comes in, but you'll really see it when I, when I go into the solar um, activity cycle, which will be one of the next set, sets of courses that we do. And I'll really talk about how the galactic cosmic ray um, these particles end up, I know they're called rays, but they're really not rays, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but I'll talk about how they actually impinge on the edges of our solar system, basically our sun's magnetic shield, and how they get through. There's a very specific way they get through, and it actually does vary not only over solar cycle, but which solar cycle you're in, believe it or not. Uh, sometimes they get in a little bit better than others, and so we'll talk about that when I, when I go into a next set of courses. But I might mention it a little bit today. Another kind of radiation we have is trapped radiation. Now this is around Earth in this case. Other planets also have their own trapped radiation belts. We call them the radiation belts. Some people know them as the Van Allen belts. If we get a chance, I'll mention something about them today. Um, and I'll talk a, just a little bit, maybe show you a little bit of a movie about how, the, how dynamic they are. But I will not go into the heavy details of what goes on inside the Earth's magnetic shield simply because that's a whole course in itself. Are you kidding? That's a whole PhD in itself. So that will be something that I'll have to go into later because we'll, in that case we'll probably end up talking very much about satellite anomalies and the health and safety of spacecraft as well as people working in space uh, because that's very much what that near-Earth um, environment is like. But this is another type of radiation. A lot of this radiation comes from the sun or comes from galactic cosmic rays, but then it gets trapped inside the Earth's system and what happens is that it begins to get accelerated because the Earth's magnetic shield acts as like a particle accelerator, literally, like a particle accelerator. And so these particles that sometimes are energetic when they enter, sometimes they're not energetic, they're very what we call thermal or cold, and these particles end up getting energized over time. And there's all sorts of dumping processes and things like that as well. But um, these, uh, these, these have their own kind of class of, of particles, okay? So I won't talk about them too much today. And then the one that we focused on dramatically has been, right, solar radiation storms. These are the ones that come from the sun, and there's essentially two different types. The first two classes have been talking about these. The two different types are the ones that are driven by solar flares and solar storms, right? 
Okay. Again, th I'm just reviewing this very quickly. This is not. I'm not teaching this the first time. I'm just trying to get you oriented where we left off. Okay. Solar flares will drive uh, particles in a very narrow cone. They accelerate these particles very fast, but the, but the solar radiation storms that come from solar flares are are, are typically short lived, maybe just on the on the uh, time scale of about a couple hours or so, and you don't. Depending upon where you are, you may not see them, and I'll show you why in a sec. The ones driven by coronal mass ejections, on the other hand, and if I, as a matter of fact, I may have, do I have these as movies? I do. Look at that. So I'll play a solar flare for you. You can see it right there. Boom. Okay, and so you can get particles. That was an X-class flare, and that would actually drive some, some energetic particles along the magnetic field. And again, that was all from the other class that we talked about. And then here is a coronal mass ejection. So these are what we call the big solar storms. You can see it launching out of the sun right here. Whoops, right here, sorry. <laughs> and you can see it frozen here and then on this side of the page. And then when you go, when the movie starts again, it begins to move out. You can see the sun on this side and then we're going out into the coronagraph. So now we're going clear out into space about 15 sun lengths out. And you can see that loop continuing outward. In front of that loop, if I freeze this before it gets too weak, too dim to see, you may, hopefully you can still see it. In front of this loop, and again, I'm going over this quickly because we've gone through all this stuff before, in front of this loop is a big shock wave, okay, especially if the CME is fast, obviously, it's moving up very quickly. This shock wave is what helps drive the, the particles you get from, let's say, a solar flare. It drives them to higher energies. It also helps the particles spread out in space. So instead of just having a small little jet from, let's say, a solar flare that drives a small set of particles out into space along a narrow set of what we call longitudes, okay, just a small cone, like a flashlight, what happens with a coronal mass ejection with one of these big solar storms when it's launched is it takes that seed population, and because of that shock wave, it actually dry, it actually the, the whole shock wave now is covered in this stuff, and it, the, the particles then kind of scatter all around it. There's all these very specific processes that occur that allow the particles to kind of wind their way through the shock. They get accelerated as they do, so the particles can actually gain energy and can accelerate even other particles that weren't quite as high in energy to higher energies. And it also spreads them out in longitude. So now instead of getting a thin beam of a flashlight, you now have a floodlight okay, of these particles. You have a huge amount of particles over a very wide set of longitudes. And we didn't even know that happened until, I don't want to go on the Parker spiral. Oh, let me go to here. Um, we didn't even know that until really like the 70s and 80s, that's when we began to realize that this whole scenario of only flare-driven radiation storms, okay, and remember, this is stuff I've talked about before, um, that only flare-driven radiation storms, or only flares drove radiation storms. That was part of what contributed to the solar flare myth that good old, my old colleague, uh, God rest his soul, Jack Gosling, um, wrote a paper about back in 1993. We used to think, up until about the mid-90s, that solar flares were the only things that caused coronal mass ejections and caused radiation storms. But what we ended up finding out was that in actuality, you could have solar flares without coronal mass ejections, and they would drive a very narrow beam of, of um, you know, a very short-lived and narrow, um, yeah, I don't want to say beam. I should be careful when I say beam because... Um, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. It's not light. These are actually particles. But a narrow swath of radiation particles, radiation storm particles out toward Earth or some other planet, but in this case it was Earth. And then we'd have these coronal mass ejections that would then have this big, see this, the, the big black um, shock wave in front right here. The, the, the little yellow banana, <laughs> that's supposed to be the CME, okay? Looks like a hot dog resting in a hammock. I don't know. It, it's it's kind of silly. but. <laughs> Go with it, right? Um, I've made fun of this picture many times before. Everybody also knows what the other picture looks like with the solar flares. That actually made me kind of grimace the first time I saw it. <laughs> very, very provocative. But um, so, so we have a hammock and a, I mean, a, a hot dog in a hammock, and then we have, I don't even want to talk about what we have over behind me. Um, but in this case, uh, the shock wave is what causes 
this, the ability for these, these particles to spread out in longitude. And it's the CME being so wide and actually the way it expands out as it goes out into interplanetary space. Because of the way it expands out, it then um, has a, ends up having a shock wave that's so wide. Uh, if you want to get into the details of how coronal mass ejections expand and why, you basically have to look at something in a radial or in a, in a spherical geometry. Things in, in a spherical geometry have a tendency to, sp to, to expand very, very wide in azimuth like this, like this hot dog has. Okay, but that's a, that's a different talk. Um, at any rate, the reason why you're seeing these curved lines, if, I, if you recall, the reason why you're seeing all these curved lines in here, this is part of that Parker spiral. Now again, I'm not going to go into the details of the Parker spiral. I'm going to back up a little bit so you can see it here. The Parker spiral uh, is really how the, the sun's magnetic field is embedded in the solar wind. Granted, the solar wind is actually shooting parcels of plasma out straight radially, okay? But just like a sprinkler, you've seen those sprinkler heads that spin, right? Anytime you see the water that's coming out of the sprinkler heads, they look like they're, it looks like it's in a pinwheel fashion, right? That's what happens with the Parker spiral. And like I said before, I've, I've talked about this, so I'm not going to go and belabor it because I, I want to get to the new stuff. But if you need a refresher of how the Parker spiral works and how, you know, it, it basically is the same kind of thing uh, as what a sprinkler head, a moving sprinkler head uh, creates. You can see the sun down here because the sun is rotating. As the sun rotates, it will um, spit out these particles you know, the solar wind in radial fashion. But if you have a magnetic field that's threading through all of that and it's connected to the source region, it's going to cause this, the magnetic field to be bent in a spiral. And the reason why that's important is because radiation storm particles are charged. And because they're charged, they end up seeing electric and magnetic fields. So they will spiral around the, the electric magnetic field, or the, around the, um, excuse me, around the magnetic field in a, with a, what we call a gyro motion, okay? And I think I have that up. Oh, I'll show that in a second. I should have rearranged these slides a little bit. Um, so I'm talking about the, the spiral field. Let me show, let me back up here so you can see. So here's the sun, right, down here. And then they have a CME in this case. There's a nice little blob of a CME. That's supposed to be the shock wave, this little white thing here, okay? And then this is supposed to be a Parker field spiral arm, okay? And if I do it this way, you can see it a bit better. Here's that. So here's a radiation storm. Let's, let's not use a CME. Let's just use a radiation storm. And you can see the Parker spiral field arms coming out. And I've got the one, it's one, two, three, the third one from the, from the back here. I tried to line it up so you can see, see how it goes up and it's connected to this. So you can see the stuff in yellow. That is a uh, in, in this case, it's the orbit of oxygen, okay? It's, it's just a particle. Now, the reason why I have this up here is because depending upon the species, you have a different mass, right? If it's an element, if it's a, if it's a small element like a proton, it's going to have a really, really tight spiral because its mass is very low, and it can spin, 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 spin. If you have an electron, its orbit will even be tighter around this magnetic field line because its mass is super, super small. Of course, it's got the opposite charge, so it will actually gyrate its, its helix will go the opposite direction. Instead of being this way, it'll be this way. But it'll still spiral out along those arms. The larger, the, the more massive the particle that's coming out, the larger the orbit it takes. Because it's hard, you know, it's like trying to, it's like either driving a motorcycle, riding a motorcycle, and you're fast off the line, and you can accelerate quickly, and you can change your direction very easily, right? You're very maneuverable. Or being a big semi truck, right? Right, you can't do it. You can't bend, move. You can't turn as quickly. You can't brake as quickly. You can't accelerate as quickly. That's the same kind of idea as the difference between, let's say, an electron and iron. Okay, the iron is the big semi truck. It's very, very slow. It's very, very hard to get it to turn and change and accelerate in different directions. Whereas an electron, boom, it's gone. It's, also one of the reasons why we use electrons to um, predict what the proton environment is going to be with these radiation storms, because electrons accelerate off the line. They're the motorcycle that accelerates off the line faster. They get up to their top speed faster than the big semi-truck, right, that's just trying to, it takes it forever to kind of accelerate. 
So um, because of that, the electrons end up getting out ahead in the race. Even if their top speeds are the same, the electrons are ahead of the protons, and so which are ahead of oxygen, which are ahead of iron. So um, what ends up happening is that the, uh, the electrons can actually give us an idea of what the intensity of the protons are going to be when they hit. And that's how we actually use electrons as a little bit, like a 15 minute to half an hour predictor of uh, what the proton populations, what the radiation storms are going to be. Because most of the, 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 from the solar radiation storms, most of the particles are protons. So that's where most of the damage comes from. And if you look up uh, Eric Posner, A-R-I-K, Posner, P-O-S-N-E-R, uh, he is, uh, he's one of my colleagues at NASA who, um, who has worked on that. And we have the release model. We have all sorts of things now that, that have been based off, off of some of his work and, and work that other people have been doing to try to forward that. Um, at any rate, so the Parker spiral, that's why I was showing about the Parker spirals. It's very important because depending upon where those field lines of the Parker spiral go, that will basically dictate where these particles end up. Right? And you can imagine, as I've talked about in other classes, you can imagine, depending upon where Earth is or where your satellite is, let's say here's ACE, okay? Let's say ACE sitting in front of Earth right over here. If you have a, particles that are shooting off of field lines on this side, over here on the west side, I'm going to call it the west side of the sun, they will end up reaching ACE and reaching Earth very, very quickly because they're really got, you know, not a straight line, but they've got a direct path to where that spacecraft is. How about if particles were shot on this side, down here? Let me go over here on the east, the east limb of the sun. Okay. Do you think they're going to reach ACE easily? Not really, right? So What's cool about it, and I've talked about this in other classes, is that um, depending upon which side of the sun you're seeing the, 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 the solar flare or the solar, you know, the radiation storm starts from, the source of that region, or the source of that storm starts from, if it's on the west limb, the east limb, or right, you know, on the earth-sun line, that will dictate how quickly you see it and what kind of shape the signature will, or it will have when it hits earth, where the fluxes will rise slowly and then peak whether the fluxes peak right away and then just die off, that type of thing. So I've gone through all of that, and again, I don't want to belabor the point too much, but let me go back to this one. Uh, for those of you who need a visual aid, here's a good visual aid for you. Whoops, as I step on stuff. So on this side, we have the flare, let's say a flare-driven radiation storm. You can see as if you're looking down at the north pole of the sun, and I've shown this before, you can see the, the thin just with a flare-driven radiation storm, you can see how narrow that beam is. So I called it a beam, like a flashlight beam. Remember, these are beams of particles, not light. But still, they're, it's a very narrow swath, OK? But look at the CME-driven radiation storm. And why do you think that is? Right? It's because of that big shock wave in front. And you can get easily radiation storms that span 180 degrees or more. As a matter of fact, the really big ones, the Carrington class ones, are pretty much 360. I've seen 270 degrees. And that's just in the last, this, this last solar cycle. And I'll show you a couple examples of that. Um, so radiation storms, especially if they've got CMEs driving them, big solar storms driving them, they can be insanely big. I mean, they're probably one of the most awe-inspiring of all of the solar-based space weather phenomena. Um, Sadly, they're invisible, <laughs> so you can't really tell. You know, they don't have really the eye candy that a big, you know, gorgeous, you know, coronal mass ejection, big solar storm as it, as it launches from the sun has. So it's not visually as, in, as impressive, but the, the damage it can do and the, the reach that radiation storms have is very impressive because they reach past the boundaries of the coronal mass ejection, right? Solar storm is kind of embedded in here. But the, the shock wave in front of that CME, in front of that coronal mass ejection, is much wider. So that means the radiation storms can reach even further around the sun, basically go almost all the way around the sun. So what makes that important is that just because a, a solar storm is launched, let's say if I'm the sun and you're Earth, and I have a gun, and I point my gun like this away from you, and I go, bam, it doesn't mean you're safe. Not if there's a radiation storm, because that the CME that launches could spread out wide enough 
and, and the shock wave in front of it could spread out even wider to the point where it actually hits you. Do you imagine, I have a gun, I shoot a gun, and the bullet is so wide that it hits you, even though I pointed it away from you. That's the, da that's the danger of big radiation storms. And we've had it happen. And I'll show you some examples, OK? So we'll start getting into the examples now. So before I do that, let me get a little drink of water. Um, how far, how long have we been on? I want to see how long was my review. Yeah, a little bit longer than I wanted. But hopefully that get, gives you guys, gets you guys caught up to where we were um, so we can move forward. Are there any major questions, anything unclear thus far? Oh, good. I'm so glad you like the visual aids. That's great. I'm very happy. I'm glad it works for you. <laughs> My hot dog in the hammock works, huh? <laughs> I'm telling you. Crazy. Have you ever seen 100 on Netflix? Are you guys asking me? Or have any of you? I don't, No, I have not seen 100 on Netflix. I have no idea what that is. I wonder what the mass of the universe equals. Oh my gosh, boy, that's, a, that's definitely not a question for someone like me. I'm a space weather physicist. I am not an astrophysicist or cosmologist. And I have a tendency to kind of know my limits. Um, and that's not something I've ever studied. But I, I'm sure you'll probably get half a dozen different questions or different answers from, from different astrophysicists and cosmologists simply because it's very difficult to, um, to estimate certain things, especially the size of the universe. There's so many theories out there and so many things we don't know. Uh, I was thinking that Tamara Scove has a military way of thinking and talking like a very martial way of expressing herself, like a military family history. Hmm. Well, it actually is right at the moment because I'm trying to run through stuff quickly because I have a tendency to drag on and all that stuff we'd already seen before, so I didn't want to spend too much time. Um, I do have military in my family, but I was not brought up in a militant or a military environment, so I hope that... I hope it's not too off-putting. I don't mean to be that way. I thought it was actually kind of a little bit more kooky and 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 unconventional, but you know, I don't know. Maybe that's good. Is it homemade booze? No, it's a jelly jar, but it's got it's just got water. <laughs> it's just big. Okay, getting to the good parts now. Yes, I agree. <laughs> okay, so it looks like nobody's nobody has any like dire question. You know major outstanding questions. Nobody's like super confused about this. If, um, again, if you need more information or if this tickled your fancy and you've not seen the other two courses on radiation storms, please go back and look at those because this was just a very quick review. All right, I really didn't want to spend much time on all that stuff. Okay, a mason jar. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, I just do. I don't know. Don't, don't ask me. Okay, good. Easy going. Good. All right, so let's get into some fun stuff. So right now I'm going to start going into some of the events um, that have, that should kind of open your eyes a little bit. Uh, and then we'll get into go uh, galactic cosmic rays. So I want to show maybe two or three events. Uh, some of them I kind of gave a preview in the last course, uh, but some of them, some of them you haven't really, I haven't put the pieces together yet. So what you're about to see is the same radiation storm thing. I think it's on this side, am I correct? Yes. This is the same radiation storm that uh, I played earlier, but now I've just got it. I've got a nice bigger version of it. And so you can see, I mean, here's I've frozen it at, on the 28th. Whoops, let me stand here. Um, I've frozen it on the 28th, so you can see what an incredible blizzard it really was. I mean, the sad thing about these radiation storms is that they absolutely blind us when it comes to coronal mass ejections. We use chronographs like this to be able to gauge when, when a big solar storm launches off the Earth, or launches off the Sun. We use these things to gauge how fast is it moving, um, because we can watch the front move out. But when you get a big radiation storm that blinds you to this degree, you're lost. That chronograph is gone, basically, for the duration of that, sol of that radiation storm. And sometimes these radiation storms can last days. Now, not quite this intensely, so the blizzard dies down, but it still can obscure things long enough that it makes it very difficult for us to have an accurate idea of what the CME look like coming out. So, and when you get a big radiation storm, oftentimes you'll get a big CME coming out too. That's fast. And so it's that much more critical that we actually can uh, measure these things and observe these things, but we end up not being able to uh, for this reason. And oftentimes, even when you think of stereo, which has either a side view or a, or a far-sighted view of the sun, because of the extent that radiation storms, you know, 
can block out and can, can travel in longitude, oftentimes those chronographs are, are obliterated as well. So we're kind of stuck. We become blind, literally blind, for a short while when we get these big radiation storms. And that's not what you want to hear when there's a Carrington class event coming, but that's what happens, sadly. And I don't know if we have a good way of getting over that quite yet. We're doing certain things with inter uh, IPS, interplanetary scintillation, using radio arrays. There's a couple other things that we're doing that, that allow us, you know, of course we still have on-disk imagery, um, but it, it's, there's, some, there's some trouble. There's some ground-based imagery that we can use as well that help us, but our space-based chronographs really do go blind, and, and I don't think enough people appreciate that fact um, when it comes to some of these events, and they, you know, they see that we don't put out predictions, and it's like, well, why isn't you know, what, what is Big Brother hiding? No, Big Brother isn't hiding anything. We just can't see. <laughs> Give us a break. So, um, so that's the problem there. But anyway, let me play this and I'll, and I'll, I'll let it go. Um, whoops. Why don't you, there we go. I'll let it play and then um, you'll see also, recall that these, oftentimes these types of events, if you remember the CME lecture, lectures, Oftentimes it's a series of events. When you get a bad actor on the sun that rotates into view, that bad actor fires repeatedly over and over and over again stuff. And so it's not just one storm that you end up having to sift through, it's multiple ones. And all of them have effects. So here's back in 2003, this is what we called the, the Halloween storms. This wasn't all that long ago. It, it, and Halloween storms really trashed our, a couple of our satellites pretty badly. Um, and you'll see, here's... Um, including the SXI imager on GOES. Uh, here's 24, 25, you'll see it on the 27th. You start seeing a little bit a little bit of fuzz coming now from, there's a little bit, now ready? Here it comes. Boom, look at that, ouch, okay? And then we're not done, boom, there's another one, oh my goodness, and then on the 4th, so see we're already in the 31st by the time things clear up, so from the 27th to the 31st, and then ready, one more time, ow! Okay, we get another one hitting. So we got like four or five, and you can see there's just tons. There's even more radiation storms there. Whoops. So the the interesting thing is that you know you're getting hit. It's like George Foreman just popping you and popping you and popping you, and you hardly have a chance to even get back on your feet before you're hit with something else. And that's what happens at Earth. I mean, it's not just the satellite that's having this issue. Earth is getting hit by this, right? So on October 27th. If I show you these, these are um, observations of, of mixing of a particular um, constituents in the in the upper atmosphere, and it's a really good observation of things like ozone holes. Okay, so on October 27th, but everything looked normal. Okay, you can see this is Antarctica. Um, this is the southern pole. Okay, and this is so it's a polar pass, and then on October 29th, you saw that we had what two radiation storms go by, you know, boom, boom, hitting Earth. And the way Earth's magnetic shield works is that these, these particles, um, you know, Earth has, Earth, Earth's magnetic shield doesn't just, uh, doesn't let particles in from the front, to believe, believe it or not. It actually ends up having particles being able to enter at the poles and also from the tail. Most of those energetic particles actually enter from the tail and are shot forward and come in to the poles from, from behind, believe it or not. But there's, there are these, these weak points, these what we call open uh, field lines that connect straight to that Parker spiral that we talked about before. And because of that, it allows these particles to have a straight path right into our, our uh, North Pole and our south, Southern Pole. And yes, that's changing as our Earth's magnetic shield is changing. That will change. Eventually, we'll have four poles. <laughs> Wouldn't that be neat? We have a multipolar Earth. Um, so radiation storms will get in from different angles than what, what we knew before. But for all practical purposes in our lifetime, we're probably still going to just have two, mainly a North Pole and a South Pole, even though they are kind of shifting a little bit right now. But within two days, we went from no ozone hole to a huge one. And believe it or not, even though the ozone hole uh, was created that quickly, and we had a couple more radiation storms, as you saw from that movie. Um, it took eight months to try to close this thing up. This was a model that was run with the data that they had. And this, this ozone hole, it, and this is now in the northern pole. Now remember, you have it both in the northern and the southern poles. 
it took eight months at a height of 42 kilometers, worked, which is where the depth of this thing was, the, the deepest well of this ozone hole was, eight months for this thing to close. And that was just for the radiation storms back in 2003. Okay? These weren't Carrington-class events. I think the radiation storms were like at an S2 and an S3 level. But Earth's atmosphere, especially in the poles, gets decimated by these radiation storms. Does it affect nucleation? Sure. And you'll see very quickly, a lot of people talk about um, cloud formation uh, with GCR and with these radiation storms. And you'll see very quickly how interesting it can get um, because, uh, I just got a buzz, hold on. Is somebody trying to tell me something? I have to pay attention. Um, no, I think everything's cool. Okay, just making sure nothing, no problems, right? Okay, good. Um, sorry. <laughs> I just want to make sure everything's okay. My audio's good. Everything's good. We haven't lost anything. Um, at any rate, you'll see with the neutron monitor stuff when I talk about cosmic rays, how interesting it can get with, with things like seeding clouds because of the way these particles can actually enter and the way things are actually being detected. I don't think we know everything about how um, ground level events are, are observed. And I wish there were a lot more neutron monitor people working with, um, with uh, meteorologists terrestrial meteorologists simply because they know far more about how uh, particles enter um, or you know are detected at the ground and how they might actually be um, seeding clouds uh, at, at higher altitudes than I think even space physicists understand so uh, it'd be it'll be a neat field as it begins to you know the, these two worlds begin to collide a little bit more and we start getting more cross pollination uh, pollination with the sciences but at any rate so these things can be long, long lasting, okay, very persistent. And you can imagine, nowadays as we're flying, right, we have so many polar routes. Uh, you can see why I have radiation storm warnings for people who fly an aircraft. Because if it can do this to the atmosphere, imagine if you're having to fly, you know, five or ten hours on an inter intercontinental flight to, you know, Europe or vice versa, Europe to here or something like that. You've got to fly through these regions. And if there's a radiation storm, and it's big, look how wide the region is that you can actually get hit by. Okay, It's affecting all of this. So um, particles can penetrate to a great degree and take a long time for things to, it can take a long time for things to heal. You know, a lot of people think that the CFCs and the, uh, the chlorofluorocarbons right back in the 1970s are the only thing that damaged the ozone holes. It's not true at all. Space weather does it all the time. Okay, so. Now I'm going to show you the Carrington class event of 2012. And I did show this last time. Um, but I'm really going to show it to you more, not so much for, for the, Carrington, the, the event itself, but more for um, setting up the event of 2017, or the series of events in 2017. And as you can see, this is a, this is a, um, a movie um, from Enlil. Enlil is our space weather um, this is from this is from NASA, and uh, we've got one at NOAA as well. But this is the NASA version of the model. What you're looking down at is a, a the, the north pole of the sun, and again you're seeing that Parker spiral. Okay, and I'm not going to go into super detail about what everything is, but that's what the, the the dashed lines are essentially the magnetic field lines that are threading through whatever um, planet or or spacecraft that is connected. So the little red dots or the little you know, yellow circles or something like that. You can see what the what they all mean. Earth, Mars, Mercury, Venus, all up here. So you can kind of get an idea. And then the Parker spiral field lines are what you're seeing, trying to show you where the source region on the sun is that's connected to that. So if they were to actually see a radiation storm, for example, you would know where the source region of that would be. Okay, or where where they where a, uh, if a radiation storm were to happen at a particular source region, that it would most likely hit that particular thing, you know, that particular planet or spacecraft very, very rap rapidly and, very, and, and be very, very intense. So that's what the point of those, those um, if anyone's ever wondered, that's what the point of those dashed lines are for, is to show you magnetic field lines threading things. Now, of course, you see this big bubble coming out, right? Remember before in the past, we, we looked like a big banana, right? A banana in a hammock. Well, this thing is now the banana. <laughs> um, that is the big Carrington class event when it was launched. And this is a model 
that we did of the solar wind with this big thing leaping out. We don't have, um, there's a lot of limitations to this model, so don't you know, take it with a grain of salt. But what it does show very clearly is how big this thing was and how, how fast it moved. Okay, So if you get out to, let's see if I can put my hand right about where it is here. Okay, Right there, that, well, and that's little square, the red square, that's stereo A. That is the orbit of Earth. Okay, And you can see, if you look at the dates and how quickly it passes, that thing got out to the orbit of Earth in about uh, less than a day. Okay, this thing was fast. So this was definitely considered a Carrington class event. Stereo A actually saw it. It went right through stereo. Don't worry, it doesn't hurt the spacecraft because the spacecraft isn't in Earth's magnetic shield. If it were in Earth's magnetic shield and Earth's magnetic shield took all that energy, yeah, then you could get some real damage to the spacecraft. But the spacecraft sitting in interplanetary space, it doesn't care. Um, the radiation storm from it probably, well, it did cause. They had, they had to shut some things down, and there's still some data missing, I believe. They had to reconstruct the data um, to, to um, you know, because it, it saturated instruments and caused issues. But uh, overall, you know, Stereo A has been fine, even though a Carrington class event went through it. But one thing I want you to look at, and I believe, I believe I have it here. Yeah, I do. Okay. One thing I want you to look at is look at where Earth is. Okay, over here it's the yellow circle, right here. Okay, Oop, if I can get to it there. So you can see that the sun, when it shot this thing, it shot it away from Earth, right? Shot it on the sun's west limb. This side is the west side, over here, and it shot it kind of to the far side of the sun. Didn't shoot it to, towards Earth at all. Okay. However, Earth saw a radiation storm. Okay. Now, of course, Stereo A over here right in front. You bet Stereo A saw a radiation storm. That's not surprising. Right? And believe it or not, we also saw a radiation storm at Stereo B, which is clear over here. Can you believe that? All the way on this side. So let me show you this. So here's the data that went with it. Here is the Stereo A when it actually saw this big um, coronal mass ejection and the solar flare that went with it. You can see Look at this massive region. I mean, it was just a very, very large region that was that uh, caused this this eruption, and the radiation storm, as you imagine, took off right away. If I flip to this side, um, Stereo A is showing. There's multiple instruments here on this. This is a time series that goes from the 23rd, essentially, of July to the 24th of July, and then up on this axis is just um, intensity. Okay, so how many particles are you getting at, you know? At a per second or something through through an area through the instrument. Okay, the instrument's a defined area. We call that flux, and there's all sorts of ways of defining it. But just know that it's how many particles are passing through a specific target in a in a, in a period of a specific period of time. Okay, and that's what they're measuring here. So you can see with stereo A, that's the black. It's actually the black and the blue. You can see the particles go up and down, right? But you can also see it goes at Earth in green. <laughs> the particles also go up, right? And then believe it or not, even at stereo B, it took a little while because the if you if I I'll go back in a second, but you'll see the CME was shot on the opposite side, like directly away from stereo B. And yet stereo B, even after a couple days, it took the particles a little while to get there, but even those particles went up. See that? So this is how intense radiation storms can be. You can shoot a CME this direction, and yet it's observed completely, almost com all, the, all the way around the Earth. Here's, here's where Stereo B was. See that? OK. So we saw it at Earth. We saw it at Stereo A. We saw it at Stereo B. You know, at the time, I don't know if we had, I, 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 I haven't checked to see whether or not we saw it at Mars. We might have. I'm not sure we did. Um, I know we saw it at a different. I know we saw a different one. I think we did see it at Mars as well. I just don't have that data with me. But I think Curiosity actually saw it at Mars. So here's Mars. Oops, not too far. Sorry, <laughs> walking too far away. Mars is clear over here. I mean, it's just it's just insane. So that's basically showing that a Carrington event can cause a radiation storm all the way around the globe, I mean, around, around the the sun's face. So now I'm going to set up. Is that right? Yeah. Now I'm going to set up this. 
Now, this is some a set of events that happened back in 2017. Anybody remember uh, Hurricane Harvey and Irma? Remember Irma decimating Puerto Rico, hopefully? Um, this, this was uh, a horrible time in space weather uh, because, you know, all the weather people were looking down at Earth and, and looking at this hurricane that was just heading toward the Florida Keys. Harvey had just hit and decimated uh, all of Texas and, and the Gulf, and then we had Irma coming, and then Marie was coming after that. And all of us space weather people were staring at the sun going, oh, my God, I can't believe this is happening now. We had this awful actor, um, this really bad actor, Region 2673, that emerged on the Earth-facing disk really fast. I mean, within several days, it went from um, basically something slightly ugly to something incredibly ugly. Uh, what you're looking at here in this plot is a magnetogram. So this is basically showing the magnetic field of the sun. And it really is only showing outward pointing field and inward pointing field. Okay, I believe blue points in and red points out. Uh, it, it's not super critical. What is critical is that the magnetic field, you never want magnetic field that's pointing the opposite direction. Magnetic field pointing the same direction, that's fine. But you point it in the opposite direction, uh-oh, that's bad news. So you never want red and blue touching each other. <laughs> anymore it's kind of like politics, right? Hey, the closer red and blue get to one another, the, the worse, the, the more fireworks you're going to see. So kind of look at it that way if, you're, if you happen to be American and, and you know, enjoy jokes about politics. I hate politics, it's terrible. But at any rate, um, so this went from, if you look at the, the spot, this, this sunspot region, this, this set of sunspots, you went from something that was reasonably simple when it first emerged uh, being red, just a simple red and blue region. And then within two days, it went from just that simple region to a red, blue, red, blue, red. And it was like this multi-layer cake. And that meant that magnetic field was pointing in opposite directions and being squished together. And so all of us space weather physicists and, and solar physicists were looking at this going, oh my god, we're in trouble. And sure enough, um, within in, in a single week from, oh, that's too bad. I don't know why that doesn't show. That shouldn't be um, covered. This text shouldn't be covered. In a single week from September 3rd to September 10th, I believe this is supposed to say, uh, we had four X-class flares. Okay, and uh, I, don't, I haven't, don't know if I've gone over the, the radiation and the, all the storm scales, but there are scales for radiation storms, uh, solar storms, meaning coronal mass ejections, and solar flares. All the scales go from, from one to five. Okay, the scales only go to five. The most extreme event is five. So we had four X-class flares at a, a scale level of three to four, R3 to R4. Remember, the scales only go to five. We had 20, there's actually like 25 M-class flares at a scale from you know, R1 to R2. So these are radio blackouts causing, being caused by um, the sun screaming. And then we had two solar radiation storms at the S2 to S3 level. Again, the scales only go to five. And then we had geomagnetic storms uh, one, one of them, I, I'd say two geomagnetic storms, only one had a G4 level when that was, uh, at one clipped us. Um, the other one also clipped us, but it, it, it only gave us a G1. And so this bad actor just was constantly, all the way across the sun, was just firing this nasty stuff at us. And you can see, if, wait, this side? <laughs> yeah, this side. Um, everything is mirrored for me, so it's hard sometimes. During this radiation storm, you can see that that's, that's what's up here. And I've talked about this stuff before with the DRAP, with this particular model. All of this red up at the poles, that's all stuff going on because of the radiation storm. And if you look at, at no, this, this image down here, this is the actual radiation storm stuff. We actually had it up to an S2 level. And it would sink down to an S1 level and then immediately jump up to the next radiation storm. So you can see it kind of goes down, and then it jumps back up. And this is over the course of, let's say, one, two, three, four days. So along with the, the, the geomagnetic storms and the solar storm, you know, the big CME hitting, we also had radiation storms on top of that. So any type of communication, emergency communications, on, especially on Earth's day side, was gone. Global you know, communications at the, at, the, at the Earth's poles was also totally decimated. Navigation was decimated. There, you couldn't do SNR with GPS uh, in, in, you know, um, um, enabled drones. You couldn't get ham radio. Even on the, the sun's 
you know, on, on the Earth's dark side, the, the night side, you couldn't get stuff going because you had to deal with the solar storm walk, totally trashing ham radio. So FEMA and, and even the satellite phones because of the solar um, flare, you know, the solar ra radio bursts, we were getting um, indications and, and reports from the Red Cross that their satellite phones weren't working. And, um, and they thought it was the hurricane causing problems. It's like, no, the hurricane isn't causing these problems. The problem is that we've got solar radio bursts on top of this. And it guaranteed the solar radiation storms were probably trashing the satellites as well during that period of time, causing extra problems. So it was just what we call a perfect storm. You have all of this infrastructure on the ground that's not being able to function because the hurricane is taking it out. And now you're in desperate need of emergency communications. You're in desperate need of reconnaissance. You're in desperate need of, of any type of, of, of help and, and relief, and you can't get it because you can't even communicate. You can't even get a drone to give you a lock, a GPS lock, so that you can do any search uh, and rescue. And you're still, for an entire week, getting barreled by radiation storm after radiation storm, radio burst after radio burst you know, CME after CME. I mean, this is just what happens. And in case you wondered how big of an event this was, let me stand on this side. Here's the Carrington event of 2012, okay? This is how big it was, how fast it was, right? This is what we've already looked at. Look at this one in September 2017. See it here? A little bit slower, right? A little bit? Not much, not much slower. So the radiation storms that it was driving was almost as intense as this Carrington class event. Now remember, 2017, luckily, because it was shot on almost the back side of the sun, similar to this, it barely hit us. This particular event, believe it or not, did clip Earth. We only got a G1 level solar storm out of it. Right? A geomagnetic storm was, was reasonable. We could handle it. Thank goodness, because if it had been, if we had gotten the nose of this thing, I mean, it would have wiped us out. It would, we would have had grid troubles, major grid troubles at this time as well. So you could imagine us trying to fight that along with all these hurricanes. And suddenly it makes the, the collision of space weather and terrestrial weather very, very real. So, um, you know, that's something I wanted to show you. And this is a recent event, guys. This is, I'm not going back into the annals of history for this. This is recent, okay? And we expect to see more of this because the, the solar activity cycles that we're in right now are small. And that is deceptive because you think, oh, some low activity cycles mean low chance of big events. No, actually, it means a higher chance of big events. And the reason for that is because it has a bigger chance of making these layer cakes that are very confused with magnetic field that points in different directions. Simply because the sun's hemispheres, the magnetic hemispheres, are out of sync. They're not in concert. When they're in concert, they add to one another and drive really large amplitude cycles. But their magnetic fields are working together. When they're out of sync, they don't drive as big a cycle because they're not really in sync with one another, and so they fight each other, but suddenly the magnetic field gets very complicated. And it's the complicated magnetic fields that can drive massive events. Okay, We may not get as many of them, but we get them, and, and they can be more intense. And that's why you're seeing us talking about Carrington events um, far more recently than we you know, might have a while ago. And that's why we keep saying things like, well, Space physicists aren't trying to say that, you know, we're not just trying to scaremonger. We're trying to say, look, we just happen to be in the low activity cycles, and these cycles are the ones that drive Carrington class events. And oh, yeah, by the way, it's a 100 year storm, and we are overdue. And it, that makes sense because the sun is in that cycle now. Now, there have been Carrington events that have been fired, as you can see. We are just happen to be lucky and gotten out of the firing line. And that's not the only time that's happened. That actually happened, and I'm not going to do this. Oh, I, I guess I could, well, I talked about this last time. This was Mars. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, because, you know, I've already brought it up before, so I'm not going to belabor that point. But w this is not the first time we've been lucky. Okay, we were actually lucky back in the Apollo era. And, you know, I, I, I a couple courses ago I brought this up and talked about the fact that when we did the Apollo programs back in the late 60s and into the early 70s, we had 17 of them, right? And if you look at this chart, I know you probably can't read it. It probably doesn't read very well. But you can see in, in this 
diagram here over the timeline from 1968 to 1973, essentially. You can see on the, uh, the top of this shows uh, in light blue all of the Apollo mission numbers. I think it shows all of them, right? Oh, it shows from 7, from 7 on to 17, okay? And what you see down here are these little spikes. And I've mentioned this before. And what these spikes are are solar radiation storms, okay? Now, on this side, they're kind of showing kind of like a stoplight, di stoplight diagram from basically, they should have had the yellow be green, but it's okay. This is just your annual natural radiation exposure here if you're on Earth. And then you move up to an annual exposure for a radiation worker. That's the slightly orange. And then you get deeper orange, and then this is like, you know, radiation sickness. Um, if you were to get exposed to this degree of radiation. And then the red, of course, that's fatal. Okay, so they're showing these lines going across of what the radiation dose would be um, for these categories. And we've done forensics on this stuff, so we know pretty well what, what happened. And if you look back in 1968, 1969 was solar maximum for that particular era, okay? And you can see there's a ton of radiation storms, right, clustered in here. If you look at where the blue vertical lines go down, we got lucky. They basically missed all of them. They definitely missed all of the severe ones. Okay, so we had a few in, especially when Apollo was just starting out, right here, that people could have gotten radiation sick. I mean, really like, you know, had maybe organ damage or just had been feeling really ill and then had long-term issues, maybe even felt their skin burning and not understanding why their skin, they're getting this horrible sunburn it feels like and you know why am I getting bubbles and blisters on my skin and I don't understand why um, that could have happened many times over the, the especially the early to mid Apollo mission missions but look at this one over here 1972 do you see this now we had um, I think it was March we had Apollo 16 okay but in 19 in August of 1972 i got to stand over here. I'm not pointing at the wrong place. So Apollo 16 was in March or April, I believe, of 19, 1972. But we had this incredible event in August of 1972 that would have changed everything. If the mission, if the Apollo mission 16 had been then or 17 had been moved up, that would have been awful. As a matter of fact, if it had been 16, 17 would likely never have happened because these astronauts would have died right there, right in their space capsules, right there in their dune buggies, right there with their little golf clubs playing on the moon. They would have just died. And at the same time that all that was happening, we would have linked it because of what was happening at Earth. Okay, and I'm going to show you this now. This was a set of events that was, and I've talked about this in, in the CME class. I don't think I've brought it up in this one yet. I did, I did, and I did bring up little bits and pieces of it in the solar flare stuff because, you know, there's, like I showed with the 2017 event, when you have a bad actor on the sun, it isn't just one thing, right? It's over and over and over again. And it's, it's this, the, the bad actor will fire a solar flare, and then it'll fire a solar radiation storm, and then it'll fire another flare, and it'll fire CME, and then it'll fire another radiation storm, and another flare. It's firing everything. It, the, it's giving you the whole gamut. Right? And it will do it the entire time it's on the Earth-facing disk because it's just angry and it just can't calm down because it's just in a bad configuration and it has to literally burn itself out, so to speak, and reconfigure and reconfigure and reconfigure. And every time it does that, it launches something else. So for two weeks, we could be bombarded by just storm after storm, thing after thing, you know, space weather catastrophe after a space weather catastrophe. And that's exactly what happened in 1972. except they were bigger. <laughs> in 1972, from August 1st to August 7th, we had four really intense solar flares. We had two on August 2nd, we had one on August 4th, and another on August 2nd. We didn't even, they were saturating the instruments at the time, so we didn't even know to a great degree how big they were. Okay, we knew they were X-class. We knew the one on August 4th was at least an X-20. And it also gave us gamma rays. We actually got direct observations of gamma rays. Okay. The ones on August 2nd and August 1st, I mean, yeah, wait, wait, sorry. 
the one on August 2nd and August 7th, they were so incredibly big and energetic that they had white light. They were observed on the ground. You could actually see the ribbons, okay? Because remember, the atmospheric window of Earth blocks out. It, extreme ultraviolet blocks out all of the stuff, the, the X-rays, the gamma rays, typically everything that we normally see on the ground, I mean, every, you know, everything that we see in space, we can't really see on the ground until we get into the far, well, well I should say the near ultraviolet, nearly, you know, um, visible. And then we're open clear down to eye into, into the infrared. And then the, the window shuts and then it opens again for some radio frequencies. But we can't see all the entire spectrum of electromagnetic light on the ground. So in order for us to actually see flare ribbons, <laughs> we act, you know, and have telescopes on the ground see them, they basically have to be white light. In order for a flare to have a white light component, it's got to be unbelievably energetic. And so not only did we see one of those, we saw two of those, okay? Guaranteed, at least we know at least one of them fired off a Carrington class CME, okay? Now I'm standing in front of, let me stand on this side. Actually, let me stand on this side. I'll get over the words so you can actually see the pictures. So here are some calcium images. Uh, all these were all ground-based. I remember back in the 19, early 1970s, we really didn't have, we had no on-disk images and space telescopes. We, 72 is when we launched OSO, um, OSO 7, which had its first chronograph, where we were actually able to look at CMEs for the first time. We weren't even sure what we should be observing CMEs in. And if any of you have taken my my, my first CME class, you will remember all that. Um, there's a very interesting, a very lush history of how we started learning about what space weather is and what coronal mass ejections were. And we basically learned it from eclipses on the ground. We knew the sun had a corona, we wanted to study the corona. So we put up coronagraphs, you know, we made a fake eclipse in space. And that was how we first started doing it. That was OSO 07. So we didn't even have anything like these types of images in space. These are all ground-based images. And so you can see in the calcium line here, you can actually see that flare. You can actually see the flare ribbons. Yikes, pretty dang big, huh? A close-up version of a sunspot, this is what it was. It was a sunspot grouping like this. We did not have magnetograms at the time, so we can't give you which one's red, which one's blue. But guaranteed, all of these probably have tons of red and blue and, and are you know very massive. Probably each one of these close to one another is a different color. Um, and that's why it was, able, it was, it was so unbelievably... Um, unstable. And then you can see a filament right here that comes off. And that filament, I think, lifted off, at least partially lifted off during the big, um, yeah, from the ground-based observations with the Carrington class event. It had that filament in it. So uh, when this event happened, it created, as you can see from looking at the words here, it created an extreme radiation storm. Okay, that disrupt, disrupted the spacecraft and their instruments even back then. Okay, now, and, and I'll show you some more things that it did. Um, the radiation storm caused an ozone hole that lasted four years. Can you believe it? They studied this. It lasted four years. Remember the one I talked about before? The, two, the, the um, Halloween event lasted eight months. This lasted four years. Can you imagine? <laughs> And then it destabilized part of the North American power grid way back when, when the power grid wasn't anything like it is today. And this is the part that was classified until just recently, just a couple years ago. Dolores Knipp started uh, a good colleague of mine. If you ever want to read her paper, it's open in Space Weather. She's the editor of Space Weather. Uh, and I do believe you can get this paper that as open access. Um, but she found, she, and she had worked for the Air Force uh, for quite some time, so she had a lot of connections and was able to hop on a recently declassified uh, set of events that occurred that caused 2,500 sea mines in Southeast Asia to detonate. <laughs> and I know it made a big buzz when it first came out, her paper, because it's pretty, pretty crazy. But back then, all of our sea mines were, um, at least the American military sea mines, were uh, magnetically triggered. We had these relays, these magnetic relays, and the whole reason for them was that the mines were designed to sense the change in magnetic field if a metal hull went by. So like a ship, a bow of a ship or something like that, with you know being metallic, would actually alter the local uh, magnetic field in that region um, because of its conductivity. So it would sense that, and it would cause it to detonate. Well, they had no idea that a 
a solar storm could cause Earth's magnetic field to rattle so much that it would simulate, it would be a big enough change in the magnetic field that the sea mine would actually think that something was driving by it, an enemy craft was driving by. And so all at once, it, could you imagine, 2,500 sea mines in Southeast Asia just went pop, 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 okay? And we also at that time had long duration radio bursts that, it, that exceeded one gigahertz, which those of you in the know, when the sun screams at one gigahertz or above, goodbye GPS, GNSS, Bido, Galileo, you know, all of those, as well as goodbye satellite phones, goodbye Sirius XM, goodbye any type of satellite communications that is typically earth to ground. Um, because you're going to be, the sun is going to be screaming from low frequencies all the way up to if you're up above gigahertz, you know, several gigahertz or higher, as we know from um, some of the classes I've taught about when the sun is screaming, these frequencies can go very, very high into multi gigahertz, if not tens of gigahertz. So uh, when the sun is screaming to that degree, pretty much all communication goes out. And think about ADSB with airlines. Think about trying to land a plane. Ain't going to happen. Okay. So imagine if this had happened in today's era, right? And thank goodness it hasn't, but it is still possible. But imagine also the idea that a CME this fast then caused all these problems at Earth. Of course, you're going to see a CME hitting Earth, causing aurora. The aurora is going to come all the way down to the equator. And at the same time that all of this is happening at Earth, okay, you've got astronauts on the moon that are dying. Pretty intense, huh? This is what our life could have been. Now imagine if that happens now. Right? Just think about that, because I'll get back to that. So here's the CME that hit. Am I going to still? I'm standing in front of it again. So here's the CME that hit. Those of you who have been through the CME course know a CME that's traveling at you know over 2,000 kilometers a second, which is what you're seeing right here, the velocity, the speed, basically. This is all reconstructed. Um, it's the fastest CME that was ever recorded back in 1972. Okay. Still, to this day, it's the biggest we've, we've, we've physically recorded. Um, the average CME transit speed ended up being about 20, 2850, so by the time we were reconstructing it, it had decelerated significantly because you're not seeing the fast, you know. But the, from, from the time it launched at, at the sun to the time it hit Earth, the average travel speed was 2850 kilometers a second. That's insanity. There are shock waves that don't travel this fast. So this thing was unbelievably intense. Um, and then there was a huge, big den density enhancement upwind, and uh, and the, the DST. Luckily, the DST, which is the disturbance, the disturbance storm time index, it's kind of like KP, but it's made more for scientists. Um, and it it me it's a measurement of um, of really what we call the ring current. It's kind of like the radiation belts, but the low energy part of it. Uh, there are particles that travel in that same ring, but they're low energy. They're colder. And, and um, they tell us they, they have a, a huge influence on how our, what, how our magnetic shield is changing. Uh, and that's really what the DST measures. But what it showed us when the DST index only hit this, hit this, this minus 125, um, which is nothing. We've seen big storms like this. You would expect it to be minus 300 or even higher or even you know, deeper. Um, so minus 125 is not that intense. The geomagnetic storm that hit us really wasn't nearly as intense as uh, what it could have been, most likely because the magnetic field wasn't oriented the right way. So we got very, very lucky, even with the 1972 event, um, because it, it, um, it was incredibly fast and incredibly powerful. Now imagine if this, to this day and age, before I even talk about the, well, I guess I'll talk about, I'll talk about this now. This is the um, atmospheric, and I, and I probably can't even show you very well, because this is a very old plot. But this is at 30 to, or 38 kilometers altitude, OK? And this is what happened with the radiation storm. So now we have, we have the radiation storm hitting, hitting the moon. We have the radiation storm, or I mean, the ra and the radiation storm hitting Earth. We have the CME hitting uh, Earth at the same time. And, um, detonating sea mines. We have aurora coming down close to the equator. We have uh, radio bursts that are exceeding one gigahertz. And now we have our ozone hole <laughs> that lasted four years. 
um, during this period. Okay, so they said that the remnants of this, of this ozone cavity that they saw actually rotated, they say semi-rigidly semi rotated, meaning it, it, it literally rotated with the Earth's atmosphere in a circle and didn't change at all, didn't heal, didn't anneal, didn't nothing, just stayed like this for 50 plus days before it began to slowly close and it took four years for it to finally completely close up. If it's similarly, ro you know, rigidly rotating for 50 days, that means that it was still, that the damage was still being done. Even though the radiation storm was over, there was still damage being done because of all the free radicals and everything else that, all the, all the chemical processes that were occurring. Um, and, and it just literally couldn't, it was festering, like a wound that was festering for that long. Um, and for those of you who are, who are uh, ham radio operators, uh, over Russia during this period, there was a, temporary nightside mid-latitude e-layer just due to the radiation storm. That shows you at mid-latitudes. So this radiation storm didn't just hit the poles. It actually, the effects of this radiation storm, the ionization of the upper atmosphere was so intense from this radiation storm that it came clear down to mid-latitudes. That doesn't mean the primary particles hit at that, at that altitude, but it does mean the cosmic ray shower, the, the or not cosmic ray, I should just say the, ray, the, the, the particle shower that occurred afterwards that we'll talk about when I talk about galactic cosmic rays. That particle shower was so intense that it helped ionize clear down into the mid-latitude region. Cloud seeding, anyone? <laughs> yeah, potentially. So these are really, really, really intense um, uh, events that affect, dramatically affect, not just, you know, the near-Earth space, not just, you know, space around the moon, not just you know, detonating sea mines. They affect our atmosphere in fundamental ways. They affect our satellites in fundamental ways. So if I try to wrap this up and, and, and get you to kind of think about how radically different our world could have been back in the 1970s when this event hit, if Apollo had been connected to it, if astronauts on the moon had been dying in Apollo 16, getting sick and just dying right before our eyes, uh, while the sea mines are being detonated, while our atmosphere is being torn apart, while ham radio operators are, are first being blocked and then getting a weird sporadic E-layer and our atmosphere is dramatically changing, um, when we're getting aurora down to low latitudes, where we're getting grid failures and issues. Um, and now, f fast forward that, okay, to 2024. Whether or not we're actually going to get people you know, moon colonists at the southern lunar pole in 2024 is still debatable. But it's going to be solar maximum. <laughs> and we plan to have a persistent lunar colony, not just people who go there and then leave. They want to build a colony, right? They want people to live there, maybe, for extended periods near solar maximum during a low solar activity cycle. Does this sound like a recipe for disaster to anyone <laughs> other than me? <laughs> the difference now is that not only will people be on the moon who may or may not have a chance to duck for cover underground or in their little lunar habitat, and I, I should show you some of the lunar habitats. They have water walls, literally water walls, to try to protect them um, from the radiation storm, but they have to get into these like coffin-like things and stay locked in this thing for what, hours, days? I don't think that's even possible. Psychologically, that's going to, I think people will be busting out of the, out of the thing and rather get burned. Um, but the, you know, and, and deal with the radiation as it is. Um, but that's a whole, you know, that's a whole nother class <laughs> to talk about. But imagine in our current era, if we had a Carrington-class event like the 1972 event, we have now astronauts back on the moon persistently and we have a radiation storm of this magnitude, along with a Clarington class CME, along with radio bursts that are taking out um, satellite phones and GPS and navigation. And now you've got people flying over the poles, you know, or in, in these polar routes, because that's, that's just the way we travel now with airlines. Um, and they're getting massive doses of radiation. And on top of that, you have aurora, you know, clear down to low latitudes. And you have, uh, you may not have sea mines detonating, but you have power grid issues. Imagine how incredibly global this whole concept, this whole um, space weather 
paradigm, um, how, how, how much of a global uh, experience that will be. And it kind of makes you think, my gosh, are we setting ourselves up for something like what we've been dealing with this, with this pandemic, right? Because it's a global trauma and it's shared. And that's one of the unique things about space weather is that if something massive hits, it's going to engulf the globe. It's going to be on a global scale. And really, there is no analog in terrestrial weather where one weather event hits globally and everybody shares in, in what's happening all at the same time. Um, that's very unique to this day and age in terms of us understanding it because of what's going on with COVID-19. So think about that. Just kind of let that resonate in your mind and, and realize that you know, we are potentially setting ourselves up for something pretty intense. And I know this went a lot further than, than just radiation storms, but the radiation storms are going to be the thing that will be the detriment, you know, will really destroy the astronauts. If we get something that is going to just galvanize um, our consciousness about space weather, it's going to be a lethal radiation storm that is incredibly massive and takes out something like our lunar colonies. Um, and I'm not even talking about going to Mars. Mars is a whole other animal because Mars, Mars's atmosphere is so thin that it's not much better than being on the moon, right? The moon has no atmosphere. It cannot be shielded from, from solar radiation storms or even galactic cosmic rays for that matter. Mars has a little bit of an atmosphere and it lulls us into a sense of complacency thinking it's just like Earth and that we will be protected on the ground from these big particle radiation storms just like we are at Earth. In actuality, that's not true. Both galactic cosmic rays and solar radiation storms hit all the way to the ground at Mars. So it's going to be far more like a lunar colony and the challenges that they're going to face uh, than it is being anything close to analogous uh, to what to colonies on Earth. So we have a lot to think about when it comes to these things. And really, when it comes to the dangerous part of space weather events, it's really the radiation storms that are the hardest to solve. Everything else is pretty transient, but man, when radiation storms hit, it can be life or death for, for people who are spacefaring. And we really need to be taking these things uh, more seriously than we do. So that's my, I'll get off my soapbox now, but hopefully that, that you know, gets you thinking about what era we are very rapidly, you know, charging off into going, Tron, 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 and you know, let's do it, let's do it, let's Elon Musk everything. And uh, yeah, someone needs to pull the reins back just a smidge because, uh, um, you know, if we're not in trouble, we're, or, I mean, if we're not, if we're not careful, we're going to get ourselves into the heap of trouble that we got lucky enough to miss back in the Apollo era. And that could bring space exploration to a screeching halt. Um, very quickly for a lot of people, and, and that, that would not be good. I don't think anybody who's a Star Trek fan would ever want that to happen. I certainly don't. So I'd rather us be a little bit less cavalier uh, and, be, and, and ensure that we will be spacefaring into the future rather than have something horrible bite us in the butt in the very wrong way and then have everybody be so petrified of space. Uh, that no one wants to send, you know, the whole concept of asteroid, asteroid mining and, and uh, living and working in space and, and colonizing other worlds goes out the window. Um, but it's a real possibility if we're not careful. So, okay. So uh, I'll take a pause for a second because uh, I think what I'm going to get into here, yeah, I could talk about the, the geomagnetic fields and stuff, but I already did. Um, these are the massive impacts at, at, um, for this event. All of this stuff is in uh, Dolores' paper, by the way. So, you, like I said, you can get it, Dolores Knipp's paper. Um, but I talked a lot about this during the Carrington class event, uh, CME class, that, where we talked about events. Here's the neat thing of the minefields. <laughs> this is the stuff that was, here's an example um, of, the, of one of the mines going off when a, in the right way when a, you know, a ship goes by. Um, but 2,500 of, 2, of these detonated, bam, 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 during, a, during that big solar storm. And that wasn't even the biggest solar storm. It was, like I said, a DST of minus 125. It's not even half the size of, of some of the bigger ones that we had back in, like, 2003. And it's all probably because the magnetic field was all pointed northward 
We got lucky. Um, so we've been extremely lucky in many ways. And that luck will run out. And we just need to be savvy about it. So I'm going to go, yeah. So I'm going to go into other sources of radiation storms. But before I do that, let me check the chat. And I'm going to check the chat and I'll check Patreon to see if there are questions. So please post them if you have. Uh, how did those storms correlate with the cosmonaut missions? I don't know. Um, I, don't think, I don't think any of the cosmonauts got radiation doses either. But that's a very interesting question. Because um, I have not looked. I am very you know, American-centric, unfortunately. And so um, a pissed off sun gun, that's funny. And so I, I don't really know. And, and um, I, what I'm hoping is that there are a lot, there's going to be a lot more medical research into this stuff. We are now beginning to see people who are medical researchers who are working with radiation who are looking at the, the same thing that we look at when we do, um, when we look at spacecraft parts. We test them for all different types of radiation. There's all sorts of different ways you can dose a part uh, to see if it's robust for against space radiation. A lot of people use cobalt-60, which is not necessarily very smart. A lot of people just use really high energetic, uh, uh, high, highly energetic particles, like relativistic particles, and that's not necessarily very smart. It, you really have to dose your part based on what environment they're going to see. And we know enough about our environments now that, that really nobody has an excuse not to test their parts, you know, what we call test as you fly. One of the ways that, that we test as we fly is we do something called ELDERS, which is extremely low dose radiation. So you do very low dose rates over a very long period of time because that there are, like galactic cosmic ray background, for example, is a perfect example of that. A trip to Mars in that low dose you know, galactic cosmic ray bath um, that we're going to talk about here in a minute uh, is, a, is a perfect example of, of where ELDERS style testing is very important for parts. Believe it or not, the medical community is finally beginning to get on board. I've now seen a couple studies where they are beginning to, to test cognitive functioning under this low dose, um, you know, low energy or high energy but low dose rate um, uh, radiation. And they're seeing all sorts of things that they had not anticipated. Psychological issues, you know, it doesn't cause the human to stop functioning, but it causes uh, people to, or, or I don't remember if they did it on rats, I can't remember, I think they, were doing, they weren't doing it on humans, but they were doing it and they were, they were seeing that it would cause psychological um, anxieties, um, kind of uh, illusions, kind of um, um, paranoid behaviors, uh, definitely a cognitive uh, dysfunction of some sort, and, and they're thinking, wow, this, is, this, this, may, this may be a bigger danger than we realized because, you know, space is already a place that is a bit scary and, and you have to deal with, you have to be psychologically sound to be even go into space and be so far away from home and deal with that kind of thing and the fact that you you're really don't have much of a lifeline. So you have to be reasonably mentally robust to be able to handle that. And if you have this low dose of radiation hitting you all the time that is now creating these artificial anxieties, boy, that's, you know, that's like, Right, that's, that's, that's just adding fuel to the fire. So, um, you know, there's these new things that are coming up that, that are making it much more interesting uh, in terms of the medical, from a medical pr perspective, because people are really beginning to realize that they need to test as they fly, even when it comes to the human part, which is the softest part, and obviously the most important. So I see a lot of, a lot of stuff, people posting a lot of stuff right now. Are there questions? Wow, how much more radically different would it be in the world today? Yes. Is there any document or article on those mines going off? Yes, that is the Dolores Knipp uh, paper. Dolores, it, just D Knipp, K N I P P. Look in space weather. Um, I, I have that uh, the link right here, but obviously you can't see the link. But it's on the little known. If I can get out of the thing, hopefully you can read this. On the little known consequences of the August fourth, nineteen seventy two ultra fast coronal mass ejection, facts, commentary, and call to action. Okay, this is Space Weather. Pay, uh, I think she published it in 2018 or 2019 now. Oh, 2018, yeah, there it is. 2018. So Dolores Knipp, DJ Knipp, okay? Uh, and it's at all. There's, there's a whole slew of people on this paper. But um, you'll find it in Space Weather, uh, the Journal of Space Weather. So that's where you can go find it. Um, 
What year did she say? 2018. Okay. Thought they were already there. I don't know what that means. Um, all right, I don't see any ma major questions, but I have seen obviously a lot of like mind bending, and that's good. I want, I want, I don't want to be a, a scaremonger. That's not the point of this. Okay, most space weather events are just that. They're they're just weather. They're you know a new you know a, a, a nuisance. They're inconveniences. Take an umbrella, that type of thing, just like a rainstorm. But there are times where there are these big big storms, just as in weather, right? Just because we know that a superstorm standy can can occur doesn't need to be you know, doesn't mean that we need to be walking around every day, you know, with a tinfoil hat on. Um, it just means that we need to understand that there's a whole gamut, and we can go from mild to wild, just like regular weather, and we need to treat it as such. Space is not empty, and big events do happen, and we just need to be more savvy and use the understanding that we have of terrestrial weather to to you know inform our decisions because you know even even terrestrial weather isn't as predictable as we'd like it to be when we watch these hurricanes form and these typhoons and cyclones form off the pacific or wherever the atlantic or wherever we look at these things and we say well it could be this it could be that and and the the longer they you know the closer they get to land the the better idea we have of what's going to happen but when they're first forming boy we're we're kind of all over the place in terms of knowing what the impacts are going to be and it's the same thing with with space weather on the sun when in a solar event you know when it when a bad actor rotates into earth view we have no idea we just know it has the potential for something dangerous we don't know that it will and we don't know that even if it launches something dangerous if that is even going to hit earth maybe it won't hit earth or maybe if it does hit earth it's at the wrong configuration so you know it ends up playing bumper cars with our magnetic shield instead of being something that connects clicks forms a single magnetic cavity and then pumps all its energy into our magnetic shield and then our magnetic shield has to go like this and, and, and do something with all that energy. Um, so, you know, there's just so many unknowns. And, and again, I, I don't want to say that if you see a Carrington event, you know, or potential for a Carrington event, oh my God, the sky is falling. No, no, it's not like that at all. It's the same thing as when you see a cyclone forming in the, in the tropics. You don't know whether that's going to be something dangerous. But let's not be stupid about it, right? Let's use the, 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 the analog of terrestrial weather to inform our decisions uh, when it comes to space weather and when it comes to colonizing other worlds or just even being on the moon or even just going out in space and Mars flybys and things like that. Um, there's a lot of things that we need to be paying attention to. And it doesn't help when we have celebrities saying, you know, space, space physics and, 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 and astrophysics celebrities saying, yes, I'll go to the Mars, give me, give me a, a ticket and I'll be on my way tomorrow. It, it does, that kind of stuff doesn't help because it makes people think um, that, that space is easy. And it's not. It's just not easy. So, okay, so if that's it, then let's get into cosmic rays. Now, I'm not going to go into this super in-depth. Um, there's there because there's some interesting things about cosmic rays that'll be that'll that'll be better when I talk about solar activity cycles. It's more some of the interesting things about cosmic rays are how they penetrate Earth, or I mean how they penetrate our our solar system um, thanks to our sun. But uh, I will talk a bit about how they're detected at Earth and um, and and how tricky it can get because there's some people out there that use neutron monitor data and they don't know. They're not necessarily careful. Neutron monitor data, that's stuff that's how do cosmic rays are detected at Earth, is very tricky. And people don't, a lot of people don't realize that. So I want to make sure people understand. Okay. Oh, my sound is low now? Uh, I'm seeing, last fan standing, by the way, your sound is so low we can barely hear you. Check, check. Really? And that's cranking up the volume. I'll see if, if my battery is still, my battery shouldn't be dying. Um, let me turn up things a little bit for you then. A little bit. I'm not going to turn it up too much. Is it really that low? Hold on. Let me check. I'm behind the camera right now. Check, check. I can hear me pretty well. Really? It, everybody, does it seem low? hot here. Um, 
I don't see anybody else complaining, but I just did turn it up a bit, so hopefully that's better. And and uh, I'm, I'm looking. Um, my chat goes nothing, and then like I get 20, 20 entries all at once. So uh, let's see. Okay, I don't see. Tamitha, I need propagation now. Do the propagation at once, please. <laughs> Yeah, well, we've got to wait for the sun. The sun has got to decide when it wants to do it. So we're, we're kind of stuck with that. All right, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start moving on into cosmic rays. So the first thing I want you to know about cosmic rays is that they're not solar, as I spill water all over myself. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they're not solar. Galactic cosmic rays come from outside our solar system, okay? If I stand, where should I stand? Can I stand on this side? Yeah, I guess I can. So as you can see, no, let me stand on this side. <laughs> as you can see here, this in here is our solar system, right? The sun is this little yellow dot in the middle, okay? And it is blowing out a solar wind all the time. And that solar wind is creating this bubble. We call this the heliosphere. Now, the solar wind, believe it or not, it's moving out so fast, it's something, and I'm not going to go into the details, but the solar wind is, is um, moving out so fast, it's moving faster than the speed of what we call the sound wave in space. No, it's not an acoustic wave, it's an analogous kind of wave, but there is something called the sound speed. So this, the, the solar wind, by, by the time it gets out to the, to the edges of the, of the heliosphere, it's moving at what we call supersonic speeds. And it has to stop. We have to slow it down. So this bubble is actually what we call the termination shock. You actually have to shock the solar wind to slow it down so that it will then be able to flow behind, kind of flow behind the heliosphere a little bit and, and, and get out of the way. Because this whole thing, this whole bubble from our sun, is pushing through the intergalactic medium, okay? It's moving. We are in a spiral arm of the Milky Way, about, what, two-thirds of the way down, one spiral arm. And that spiral arm is moving, and we're moving with it, and it means that we actually have a motion. I think it's something like 25 kilometers a second or something like that, for best estimates, through this intergalactic medium, okay? Now, inside this bubble, is all of the solar wind stuff, which means the Parker spiral, which means things like the heliospheric current sheet, which I'm not talking about right now. I'll talk about that when I go into um, um, coronal holes and fast solar, fast and slow solar wind. But it also has the sun's magnetic field, both both in the the low latitude regions and also in the polar regions. They look a little bit different. And again, I'll talk about that later. And that that shape of that magnetic field really dictates a lot about how cosmic rays get in, okay? But it creates, just know that this is creating a solar shield. Just like Earth has its own, what I call the Earth's magnetic shield, the Sun has its own solar shield, right? It's how particles get into, into and out of our solar system. Now in front of this big bubble, obviously, is what we call something called the heliopause. These are just areas in which the the intergalactic media, the, 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 but we're basically where the, the plasma, you know, of space and the plasma of our, of our, um, the, uh, the, I should say the plasma of intergalactic space and the plasma of our solar system, our heliosphere, um, where they meet, okay? And they meet kind of in stages. I'm not going to get super detailed because then we have to get into all sorts of kinetic physics. But these regimes are slightly different. Um, so you first have a termination shock that slows that solar wind. Then you have this heliopause where everything is dense and, and, and is trying to be deflected around um, and into the back, into this tail. Because so the heliosphere ends up stretching out into like a big comet tail, just the way the Earth's magnetic field does too, as it moves, as the solar wind is blowing over it. And then we end up having, at the front of this heliopause, the bow of the heliopause, we have this bow shock. Okay. Galactic cosmic rays come outside of that. <laughs> they enter through all of this stuff, 
okay? And we're still learning about a lot of this stuff from Voyagers 1 and 2, okay? And uh, also a satellite called IBEX, which is quite interesting, but I won't get into that today. Um, Voyager 2 has in exited through the termination shock and is in the, I believe it's in the heliopause now. Um, we're still trying to figure out exactly where, you know, we have an idea where we are, but there's always some argument as to, well, have we passed this region? Have we crossed through this? Yes or no? Are we in pristine intergalactic medium or not? It, you know, there's always a little bit of an argument. And only when we cross a regime do we then afterwards say, yes, yes, we crossed it, we crossed it. Um, it it's kind of sad, but that's the, way, that's the way the field works. So Voyager 2 is crossing out this way. Voyager 1 crossed out through the north. There are differences between the north and the south. Um, and anybody who's followed Voyagers, the two Voyagers um, data, know uh, a bit more about that. Again, that's not something I'm going to go in, uh, into specifically in this course because it's, it has a lot more to do with the solar activity cycle and how galactic cosmic rays enter the, the, the shield of, the, of, of our solar system. Okay. And that matters about far more, it has a far more to do with um, the solar activity cycle, solar min, solar max, and then the reversal of the magnetic fields during the different phases of the solar cycle or the different cycles. Um, Suffice to say, for this class, galactic cosmic rays are coming in at all angles, okay, because the sources of those particles are coming from everywhere, right? All sorts of different supernovas, all sorts of different explosions, all sorts of different black holes, all sorts of different, you know, there's so many different fundamental astrophysical processes and phenomena that are occurring out there that are generating these, these galactic cosmic rays, okay? Now, these cosmic rays are not are not light rays. We're not talking light rays. We're not talking things like gamma rays necessarily. We're talking mainly about protons because that's really the part of all of this galactic cosmic stuff that really ends up affecting Earth. Okay, and you'll see that shortly. But just see that because it's not coming from a single point source like the sun, the radiation storms we get from this stuff is more like a bath You've heard me say it many times. Galactic cosmic rays come in, we call it omnidirectional. They come in from all angles, and so we're bathing in it. So they are different. They interact with the sun's magnetic field differently than solar or uh, particle storms do, radiation storms from the sun do. Do they spiral around the magnetic field? Yes, because they're charged. They spiral around the field. But they're not coming from the sun, so they don't spiral around the Parker spiral quite the same way. Okay. So really, the Parker spiral doesn't have all that much to do except in the local vicinity of Earth. It doesn't have that much to do with galactic cosmic rays. We can get them from all over. Okay, now, the Earth's magnetic shield is set up in such a way that these particles, when they do enter the Earth's shield, they do enter in certain ways. And we have to worry about what we call particle rigidity for them to even get to the, Earth, to the ground. But when when storms happen on the sun, they can actually help guide solar radiation storms, the, the radiation storms from the sun. They can actually help guide those particles to Earth. But for galactic cosmic rays, <clears throat> those same big solar storms, the big CMEs, they actually shield us from cosmic rays. <laughs> they actually carve out and create almost their own little magnetic shield. And we call that those, when we see them on the, at Earth, at the, on the ground, we, we call those Forbush decreases. As a matter of fact, that was one of the first ways that we even knew that there was radiation up there and cosmic rays at all, was because we had ion counters down on the ground and some of these events were so big, we could actually see them um, hitting Earth through these ion counters, which we mainly used to count galactic cosmic rays. That was really their primary uh, designation, was to count the galactic cosmic radiation from space not necessarily to, to get the radiation from our own star. But we started making sense of things, and that's start how we started realizing that solar flares were definitely doing something when it came to radiation, and then they were launching something else that then caused these big Forbush decreases in the galactic cosmic ray population. And it really got scientists to start thinking about it, and it actually is what helped create the two-class picture of, of radiation storms, that we had radiation from the sun, rather, that we had flare-driven ones and CME-driven ones because every time we had a CME, the galactic cosmic ray radiation would go down. It's like, whoa, 
for the trip. So know that you could have multiple sources of, of particle radiation and these radiation storms, so to speak. But because of their absolutely totally different sources, the sources of these radiation storms, they end up causing totally different phenomena at Earth. And we look at them and, and view them differently. Okay, The point source stuff, that's from our sun. And so everything I've talked about prior to now has been about that. But the galactic cosmic rays, their source is diffuse and it's all around us, completely enveloping us. And so it, it diffuses into our, into, our, into our heliosphere from the outside in, from all angles, okay? which means it does have a slightly different behavior. Um, this is just another, I guess, I guess the reason why I wanted to show this one was because, let me stand on the side. I guess the reason why I wanted to show this one was because it showed, it, it, it turned the, the heliosphere around the other way. Um, and, and you'll see why in the next slide. But I wanted to also show the flow. Okay, this kind of gives you a better idea of the flow. This is a model of the heliosphere. You can see the bubble. I talked about where the termination shock is. Right, whoops, put my finger in the right place. Um, everything inside in the green region, that is, that is inside the heliosphere. The termination shock you can see is very, very strong because it, you can see the radical change. And I believe this is in temperature. Yeah, this is in Kelvin. So you can see how cool the inside of our solar system is, but then how the, sh the shocked plasma, it's basically taking all of this supersonic solar wind from inside this heliosphere and pushing it down the tail. Why? It's got to get it the hell out of the way because we're plowing through this intergalactic cosmic, you know, this, this intergalactic plasma. And this solar wind that's supersonic, that's moving super fast, has got to go somewhere. Well, it can't go out there because that's what we're plowing into. So it's got to be deflected down the tail. But in order to do that, a shock wave has to, it changes the nature of the plasma. And in this case, it's actually making it very, very hot. It's slowing it down and changing that speed into heat. Okay, into temperature. It's changing things. Okay. So that's just how the that's just how these physical things, these these uh, kinetic physics works. Really, you have to do physics of shocks to to get them get more details. But that's beyond the scope of this. So here you can see the um, there's the bow shock. Okay, which is stand stood off. It's standing off of the uh, heliopause, which is the basically the bow of the heliosphere. Okay. So it gives you a little bit better idea of what I talked about before in a little bit more realistic fashion. Okay. And again, Voyager 1 went out to the top side and Voyager 2 went down the other side. Kind of through this down here. Fortunately, one of the Voyagers, I forget which one does it say? Uh, I think it was Voyager 1 where the plasma instrument was dead. One of our, one of our Voyagers, the plasma in instrument died, so we didn't get, which really sucks. So we've had to infer a lot of the data that we got from, from that spacecraft um, through other instruments, through like the magnetic field instrument and waves instruments and electric field and stuff like that. It's really sad. Uh, we don't have any direct plasma measure measurements. But we still have learned a ton about the edge of our, of our heliosphere and how it interacts with the intergalactic medium. And like I said, I'll, I'll talk about that in a different class. So here's the interstellar medium. The only reason why I'm showing you this is that you know here again is, is our heliosphere moving into this intergalactic flow. Look at all this stuff. Um, just in our near, in, in the near region, we have things like the Oort cloud. We have Alpha Centauri. We have all sorts of we've got uh, some radiation belts in here that are all contributing to the galactic cosmic ray flux that's coming in. Okay, so there's and that's just what's in front of us in the spiral arm. The stuff comes from everywhere. So what are cosmic rays? Well, they're essentially uh, uh, el elementary particles, mainly protons. But there are other constituents. You know, it's about 50% protons. This is why I always talk about protons. They're really the ones that matter at Earth. But we do have 25% of about alpha particles. These are the helium nuclei. So it's proton neutron um, you know, um, combination. And then you have 13% are carbon, uh, nitrogen, and oxygen. Less than 1% of electrons, less than 1% are gamma rays. Uh, that's why I don't really talk about cosmic rays. When we talk about cosmic rays in space, they're not really rays. They're mainly particles. Okay? So it's a misnomer. Okay? 
the reason why we've called them historically cosmic rays and why we've stuck with that name, I do believe the reason why, is because of the shower of stuff we get at Earth. Remember, when we first detected these things, we detected them on the ground. And we never really detected the primary particles. Those get absorbed by our atmosphere. But what we get instead is this cosmic ray shower that's got a whole host of stuff. And that's what we ended up detecting on the ground. So a little bit about the cosmic showers. And realize, it's not just cosmic rays that do this. Because if the main constituent of cosmic rays are protons, well, what's the main constituent of solar particle events? Protons, right? So Earth doesn't care. Earth's atmosphere doesn't care. No planetary atmosphere cares. A proton is a proton is a proton, right? A rose by any other name, <laughs> they're protons. So you're going, to get a co you're going to get a cosmic ray shower from a solar particle event. So from a solar radiation storm, you still get a cosmic ray shower. It's kind of a misnomer to call it a cosmic ray shower because it's no longer cosmic. That's not the source. The source is from our sun. But it's still a shower because it's a proton shower. It's a shower like what I'm about to explain here. So just know that Earth doesn't care on the ground or in the, the upper atmosphere where the proton came from or where any of the particles came from, whether it came from our star or it came from, you know, Alpha Centauri. It doesn't care what it cares about, or some other super, some supernova, not Alpha Centauri necessarily, but some supernova somewhere. Uh, Earth's atmosphere doesn't care. It just cares that it sees a proton, and so it's going to have a, some type of shower related to it. So radiation storms can be bad because of, let's say, a solar radiation storm, but then during times where cosmic rays are pretty intense, like now, during solar minimum, you have, you know, you have a lot of particles incident, a lot of cosmic ray particles incident on the Earth's upper atmosphere. And it's causing a lot of, radi you know, a lot of these cosmic radi these radio showers, these um, particle showers as well. And so right now, that's why I talk about, um, for aviation flights, that, that prenatal passengers are in trouble because they're getting huge doses uh, right now. Uh, as a matter of fact, one round trip to Europe and back for a, a baby, an unborn baby, is actually something like already two-thirds, more than two-thirds, an annual dose uh, allowed for these in, in, in normal medical conditions. So um, it, it, you have to really take your flying very seriously if you're pregnant or if you're high risk during solar minimum, simply because the cosmic rays are so intense. Okay, so getting to what cosmic ray showers are, uh, proton from outer space, we, uh, we typically call them primary particles. I think you've heard me say that multiple times. They cause a cosmic ray shower, and I'll talk a, a little bit more intensely what the, the, the shower comes in multiple components. Um, some of these particles decay into muons. Muons actually reach the surface, okay? And we actually have something like... Um, a muon going through our bodies every couple, or I mean, through through a, an area about this big every couple seconds. Um, we actually have it a few more than that going through our bodies every couple seconds. Uh, so we are getting hit by natural radiation. What we just call natural radiation, but luckily our upper atmosphere shields us from most of it. Uh, oh yeah, there we go. At sea level, one muon goes through an area of the size of your fingernail about every minute. Yeah, because that's a lot smaller than the area I was talking about, and some part of your body every few seconds. Um, so parts of that cosmic ray shower actually do reach the ground. Now, believe it or not, the cosmic the reason why we call it a shower is because there's a lot going on when just from one little particle. <laughs> so we have a proton, okay, and that one proton, as it goes through our upper atmosphere, collides, so to speak, with all sorts of other constituents in the upper atmosphere. And I'm not going to get into the physics of the collision because it's, it has to do with effective. Um, cross-sectional areas and stuff. You don't really collide directly necessarily. It's, it's all sorts of other stuff. But it causes multiple types of reactions to occur. This is high energy physics here. You get these multiple sets of cascades. You get the muonic component that we talked about. The muons are the ones that hit the ground, typically. Uh, you have the hadronic component, and you have the electromagnetic component. So you can see pions, mesons, um, you know, electrons, gamma rays, muons, uh, you know, I, I say basically everything but the leprechaun. <laughs> That's what I say. This is what's happening at really high altitudes. And most of this stuff ends up being absorbed in um, 
you know, in the upper atmosphere, but some of it actually is detected down at the ground. Now, of course, here's where you get the concept of rays. Do you see some of these are photons, especially on this side, in the electromagnetic component, okay? So some of them actually are light rays, but that's part of the cosmic ray shower, okay? Cosmic rays in space are mainly particles, like protons, okay? So don't get them confused. In order to actually get light rays from a cosmic ray, you know, you have to have a shower. In order to have a shower, you must have an atmosphere. In other words, astronauts on the moon won't see this. There's no atmosphere for them to impinge upon. They will get the primary particle all the way through them. What they'll end up getting is libido, or a, a neutron albedo <laughs> coming back up from the ground when the particles hit the, hit the dust on the moon. <laughs> You'll actually get stuff coming back up that's not necessarily cool. Uh, even just the sun's light does that on the, the there's a big neutron albedo uh, coming up from the, the moon um, that even the crater instrument on, on the lunar reconnaissance orbiter has seen, which kind of surprised a lot of scientists. But um, there's, there's a lot of you know, secondary particles that end up coming up. But in this case, all of these products here that you see, these are being created by the atmosphere. And these are all called daughter products or secondary particles. A lot of this stuff can also happen when you go through airline, you know, the hull of aircraft. A lot of this stuff happens as you go through the hull of spacecraft. You can imagine going through any material is going to create stuff like this. We have things like Bremsstrahlung, for example, um, a lot of x-ray radiation that can be generated. Um, and that actually means that in some cases it's better to get hit by the primary particle and not by the secondary stuff. The secondary stuff can actually be worse. So depending upon what material you're using and what the particle radiation storm is, you know, what the particles are doing and what material they're going through, you can actually create a worse particle storm, a worse radiation storm, and a worse dose for yourself being inside something than just simply out there just taking it. <laughs> okay? And that's something that we're not super good at understanding yet. What materials, and we know what materials we should be using, but is it possible to use these materials in space and have the rigid structures that we need to be able to, um, you know, to, to adequately house our colonies. Well, that's, that's debatable. Same thing with our spacecraft and our spaceships. We want to be able to, to use things that, are, that can shield things out and can, can create a rigid structure. But sometimes the things that do that the best are the things that are the worst when it comes to shielding out radiation storms. They actually make something worse. They make the environment worse. Um, thickness has a lot to do with it too. The energy of the particles and the thickness has a lot to do with it. So, you know, it's a very delicate balance and there's a lot of trades. Um, and, you know, like I've said before, if space were easy, anybody would do it. Space isn't easy. It's not easy to, to do this kind of stuff and we can't be cavalier about this thing. So, if we look at the upper atmosphere, you can see, here's an example of particle showers. You can see here the three components coming out with a primary particle up here. Um, and here's kind of about where you start seeing this stuff and how, about how far down they go. Uh, you have Concorde aircraft, you know, flying at these altitudes. You have balloons, atmospheric balloons up here um, doing their thing. Obviously, Concorde aircraft aren't going to be flying nearly as high as even um, space tourism, right? Virgin Galactic is going to be even higher. Let me see if I can see. Um, Oh, he's in meters. Shoot. So I don't. I should. I should figure out where where Virgin Galactic is going to be, but they're going to be hit easily by the primary particles. Maybe by some cosmic ray showers, but probably not much because you're going to be at the rim of space. So they're going to be hit, being hit by radiation storms that have the primary particles in mind. Concords, you get a little bit of the primary particles, but mainly most of the cosmic ray showers. Down here, believe it or not, this is where commercial airlines fly. So you get a lot of cosmic radiation from the particle showers. You don't really get the primary particles at typical commercial cruising altitudes. But you do take radiation detectors up there. You can detect beta radiation very, very easily. People do it a lot. Um, you also get neutrons. You know, if you, anyone goes to RADS on a plane, for example, you can see a lot of that stuff. This is a, a, this is a spaceweather.com. It's Tony Phillips' work that he's been doing, trying to understand just from cosmic radiation um, what the what the particle showers and what the radiation doses will be. Know that his rads on a plane paradigm will not include solar radiation storms. 
um, he's just looking at the cosmic ray background radiations. Okay, Solar radiation storms will be a layer on top of that. Other models like NARAS will actually include solar radiation uh, particles on top because they, it, they're actually doing a real-time, um, they're taking data from, from spacecraft that are actually measuring the real-time environment. So if a solar proton storm or solar particle storm would hit, we would actually see that uh, in the, reflected in the NARAS data. So um, anybody who uses a NARAS model, um, you know, that, that's probably a better model. Once, once solar storms start hitting again, once we start seeing solar radiation storms. But for right now, during the cosmic ray, during the solar minimum, um, rads on a plane, if you're in the domestic United States, uh, that's a really great thing for you to look at to get an idea of what your radiation dose is when you go to, on commercial aircraft and flying at commercial altitudes. As you can see here, the cosmic ray showers do go all the way down to the ground. Um, so, uh, again, we talked about muons, you know, going once through your, you know, a little bit through your body every, every few seconds. Believe it or not, I have actually had people who calibrate sensitive um, radiation equipment contact me and say, hey, uh, I've been noticing about a 15% increase in, in radiation, you know, on my detectors. And I'm wondering, is that, could that be a space radiation thing? Because, because he said, um, he said, or is that could be, could that be a space weather thing? He said, because... I'm, you know, just from five years ago, I, uh, the calibration is radically different. And he says, it just keeps going up and up and up. And I said, yeah, actually, I said, that's what you're getting are the muons coming down from these particle ray showers, and you're probably detecting them. And as they come down, um, you're, 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 you know, you're seeing more of them because there's more penetration right now. The cosmic ray flux is higher. And it will continue to be so over the next few years, and then you should see it start decreasing again. I said, so don't worry, it's not your equipment. It's just literally you're seeing space weather effects in the activity cycle of the sun uh, because cosmic ray penetration is worse, is, is more intense during solar minimum because our, our heliospheric, our shield is weaker. Our sun's shield is weaker. It can't shield out all those cosmic rays. Now, just so you can get an idea, um, what the energy spectrum is of cosmic rays. And these are the primary particles. This is back in space again. But it just gives you an, uh, an appreciation for how energetic some of these particles can be. Most of the particles that we see when they have high fluxes, they're coming in at what we call low energies. Okay, so here's energy and EV on the bottom. It goes from lower energies all the way up to really, really high energies. But here's also the flux. This is the intensity of the, the, the amount. Um, remember, I've talked about flux before. It's the amount that we see going through a certain target area in a particular amount of time. Okay, so the more particles going through at one time, the flux goes up. Okay, that's, that's like a higher intensity. It just means because there's more of them, right? So that's what we're talking about here. So the highest fluxes, meaning the most particles that you see, are at lower energies. Okay, and this is um, this is going through one particle per square meter per second. Um, so if you have a target about the size of, you know, a square meter, okay, this is, this is you're seeing this, this many particles going through it. Now, as you go to higher and higher energies, okay, you're going to get, you're going to get a big drop off, okay? And I'm not going to go through all the details here. I did in my Millersville class, but I won't go through all the details here. But suffice to say, the reason why I, want, I wanted to talk about this at all is that if we get down to the really, really high high energy, some of the highest energies we've ever detected, okay, they're really rare. Imagine having one particle per square kilometer, okay, so now you're a, a kilometer by a kilometer, right, there's only one particle per year going through a target that large. But that particle, that atomic particle, that element that's flying through is so unbelievably energetic that it has as much energy as a pitcher throwing a baseball, a major league pitcher throwing a baseball. So that baseball going toward that bat with that massive ball only carries as much energy as this tiny particle going super, super fast. Now granted, we only see one of those particles through a square, through, through you know, more than a, you know, almost a, a full square mile, you know, three quarters of a square mile or so um, per year. Okay, we don't see those particles very often, but we do see them. And so it just gives you an idea of the range of energies that these cosmic ray particles can have. 
Most of the ones we worry about are up here. <laughs> we get a lot of them and they're not that energetic. But they're energetic enough to penetrate into our upper atmosphere and all the way down to the ground sometimes. And that's what we call a ground level event. Now, this is the one time I will actually talk about uh, the cosmic ray uh, modulation over the course of the solar cycle. And I'm only going to touch on it here for a moment, just so that you can get an idea. And the reason why is because I'm going to talk about um, where we are in our current cycle. But what you see here in this plot is basically from the 1930s all the way to 2010, you see the solar activity cycle. Okay, So that's the, that's the sunspot number going up and down and up and down and up and down. And from the 1930s, when we really started getting some decent measurements of cosmic rays directly, okay, this is not through like ice cores, this is through ion gauges, when we really start getting instruments that were designed to measure cosmic rays, that's the stuff in blue. Okay, Then we went into the neutron monitor era, that's the stuff you see in red. Okay, And once again, you get that same kind of cyclic thing, don't you? Up, down, up, down, up, down. But notice something interesting, and I've mentioned it before. Notice that in the maxima of solar cycles is where the cosmic ray flux drops to its lowest point. And again, look at this big cycle here in green, the height of this cycle. And look at the dip in cosmic ray. See how it's the lowest during the solar maximum? Now, at solar minimum, that's when the cosmic ray levels peak. So when the sun is its quietest, that's when it's easiest for these cosmic rays to you know, penetrate. And then when the sun is active again, its shield gets strong. The magnetic field strength goes up, and it shields out these particles pretty, pretty well. And so you see it going up and down and up and down and up and down. So this is why you see me harping on cosmic rays right now, and why rads on a plane is really good right now. Because we're not getting solar radiation storms, but we are at the peak of the cosmic ray flux pretty much right now. Um, and I don't think you can really tell all that well, but do you notice each, every other cycle looks different. Like you get a sharp peak here, and you get a sharp peak here, and it's a little bit higher here and a little bit higher here, but then the other cycles are not. There is an asymmetry in how cosmic rays um, enter our, our heliosphere, enter our, our, our sun's magnetic shield. Um, and it's based on which direction the magnetic field is pointing in the sun. So we talk about how the sun's magnetic field flips every 11 years. Well, there's actually a 22-year cycle. It's called the Hale cycle. And it's basically the 11-year cycle, but with the entire magnetic field flipping from north to south and then north again. It takes 22 years for the magnetic field to, to return to where it came from. And in cosmic ray speak, we call it a A greater than zero cycle and an A less than zero cycle. And believe it or not, depending upon which direction, which A cycle, if you're in a positive cycle or a negative cycle, that will dictate whether or not cosmic rays penetrate more intensely or not quite so much, even at solar maximum. So not only do we have the solar cycle, 11-year cycle that we have to deal with, with solar min and solar max, we also have this A greater than zero, A less than zero, 22-year modulation that every other cycle, the, the cosmic rays, the, the protons can diffuse. Or they're, they're like um, the, the diffusion of the, these protons, these, these cosmic ray protons are, are facilitated. And then in the other cycles, in A less than zero cycles, they're not. They're stood off a little bit better. And that becomes very important um, when we talk about the current solar cycle. Because right now, well, this, this right here, here's the heliosphere again. Let me show you. Here's the heliosphere, right? Here's the, here's the bow shock. Here's the heliopause. Here's all the plasma going down the tail from the solar wind being shocked and, and being pushed out, right? You can see the termination shock. You can see where the voyagers went uh, both north and south. And then here's cosmic rays. And I'll blow this up in a minute. Well, I'll show you another version of it. Uh, I know you probably can't read it. But this is from the prior solar cycle. This is from like 2001. I don't know, what does it say? Yeah, 2001 all the way to like 2011. And back then, you were watching the cosmic ray flux as we approached solar maximum. And we thought right here it was where the cosmic ray, the, the space age maximum was, the space age record. OK, that was as high as we'd ever seen cosmic rays get. And we thought, OK, that we're at solar max, and then it's going to go back down. And that was what that little white line is going back down. That was predicted. But look what happened back in our prior solar cycle. 
the cosmic rays continued to go up. As a matter of fact, they went up something like 20 plus percent higher than we anticipated. And that was the new space age record, okay? That was an A greater than zero cycle, okay? The A greater than zero cycle is the cycles where cosmic rays are, are you know, facilitated, the diffusion into our heliosphere is facilitated, okay? Here's a better look at that data. Not exactly that data. This data is from LRO. This is the crater instrument I told you about that's orbiting the moon. And this is from the prior solar cycle, so this is relative flux. And I have to thank uh, Mark Looper for this. He's given me some inside information, too, about a paper that they're just beginning to publish. Um, these are colleagues of mine from aerospace who built the crater instrument. Uh, the relative flux, as you can see, goes up, right? And then here is time, January of 20. Uh, 2010, January 2011, so these are year ticks, all the way to January 2019. Here is the space age maximum. Remember I said that that was the record, right, from that just prior plot? This was the record in an A greater than zero cycle, okay? This was 20% or more high, higher than we've ever seen in any space age, ever, okay? Or during the space age, than any cycle we've ever seen. And then, of course, it began to drop down. This is the cosmic rays dropping down. Bup, 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 bup. You can see both helium and protons. Um, and we get to a solar minimum, 20, or we, excuse me, solar maximum, 2014 to 2015, right? And the cosmic ray flux is really being stood off pretty well, right? But we are now in a, an A less than zero cycle. This means that the protons, that the cosmic ray penetration into our solar into our heliosphere, into our sun's magnetic shield, has been stood off, right? It's not, it's not being facilitated. If anything, it's being, you know, stood off a bit so that we should expect any penetration of cosmic rays to be less. It's not as easy for them to penetrate in this cycle as it was compared to the last cycle when we hit that space age record, okay, by 20 or 30 percent. But look, look at it as we're coming out and we're getting a solar minimum. Look, do you see this? We've reached that record again. But this was an A greater than zero cycle, and this is an A less than zero cycle. So in other words, we're actually, if this were an A greater than zero cycle, we would be even higher. And I just got confirmation from Mark on Twitter just a couple of days ago, like, like a week ago. He said, yeah, we're just about to publish uh, a paper, and I can't give you the figures yet, um, but as soon as they're for public release, I'll send them to you. Um, actually, he sent them to me. I just can't release them to you. Um, he said, but uh, it shows that we've surpassed even the prior record. So cosmic rays are even higher now than they were back in. And, and, again, this is an A greater than zero cycle over here. This is an A less than zero cycle, and we still beat it. So even with, with the, the added antagonism of the current cycle letting cosmic rays in, we still beat the previous cycle. So we are in a deeper minimum now, according to cosmic rays, we are in a deeper minimum now than we were in the last solar cycle. Interesting, huh? So there's a lot, you know, that's probably going to get a lot of climate scientists up in, up in arms and talking about stuff because we're, you know, saying that, that uh, you know, we, we still, there's still all the argument about how, how climate and how weather is affected by by space weather, but at least as far as cosmic ray, the cosmic ray component is concerned, we are in a deeper minimum now than we were a cycle ago. And as we get into the new cycle, that's going to be an A greater than zero cycle again. So once again, cosmic rays are going to be able to filter in even more. What's that solar minimum going to look like? Are cosmic rays going to penetrate even more? Don't know. We'll have to wait 10 years, right? <laughs> or at least five or seven. So uh, it's an interesting time. It's a very interesting time to be, to be alive. And for those of you who don't really, you know, don't think that this has any relevance to your life, um, here is, as I mentioned before, um, here's Rad's on a plane, the hot flights table. This is uh, Tony Phillips at spaceweather.com. Go take a look. It's very good. This is old data, but um, it's, it's a really good thing. And he, he maps it out by, by flights. Uh, domestically for American only, but again, this is good for cosmic rays. Here is NARA's, an older version of NARA's that used to, NARA's used to look like this. Now they only give you this chart um, here. They don't give you all this wonderful dose information. You have to actually tease it out yourself. Sadly, I hope they put. I hope they eventually. I hope Kent Tabiska is watching. He's probably not, but 
Kent, if you're watching, please put this stuff back. We want this stuff back. Um, it was always not a nice little handy tool that gives you an idea of what your dose and dose rates are. Uh, now you basically have a, a graph and um, everything else is kind of probably behind a paywall, I'm not sure. But uh, at any rate, NARA's is the one that will use real data and will include solar radiation storms when they happen. So you will be able to use, it's a model granted, but um, you will be able to use it to, to look at your radiation, your now casting for radiation dose. And why is it important? Well, people are finding as, as cosmic rays have become a bigger deal and radiation has begun, polar rotes are becoming more ubiquitous, there are being more studies being done. Okay, we're finding that space radiation is increasingly more hazardous. Um, the flight attendants are having higher incidences of things like breast cancer and prostate cancer. Pilots are having higher incidence of, cat of cataracts occurring. Um, miscarriage among flight attendants is, is um, higher than, than the general population. Um, and they're saying, oh, it's circadian rhythms. Mm, no, not necessarily. Especially when you see something like this. Cosmic induced, or cosmic radiation induced software electrical resets and ICDs during air travel. Anybody know what an ICD is? How about intercardiac device? You know what that is? Pacemaker. I don't know about you, but I don't want a pacemaker having a soft reset while I'm flying across the Atlantic. <laughs> that doesn't sound like something too good. So I'm sure I've mentioned this before, and I will continue to mention it. I'm getting more and more papers on this stuff all the time. I just need to update my charts. But radiation storms, like I said, in space or even here at Earth and definitely on Mars or on the moon, radiation storms are some of the most intense things that we have to deal with in space weather. They're the hardest to combat, mainly because human bodies were not meant to survive them. <laughs> They're... We're soft parts and radiation goes right through us and it can cause, it's very biologically active. So this is going to be the hardest thing to solve for, of all space weather, the, 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 the inclement things that can happen during a space weather. Uh, you know, GICs are bad, power grids going down is bad, GPS going down is bad, satellite, you know, uh, communications going down is bad. It's all bad, um, but none of that is necessarily directly biologically active. This is the stuff that is directly space weather to human link, direct. And, and this is the problem that for space tourism, for humans working in space, for all of that stuff, these are the things that we're going to need to watch out for. This is the reason why astronauts only have a five-year uh, active career. They're all considered radiation workers. Um, you probably also know that, um, that airline pilots in the United States are also considered radiation workers. Not everywhere are they considered that, and the crew unfortunately are not considered radiation workers, but they should be. For that matter, frequent flyers should be considered radiation workers, but you know, it's up to them to be able to monitor their own radiation doses. So I'm hoping that this is going to change. We need for this to change. It's overdue. And I don't, I really hope that we don't have to have a, an Apollo era style 1972 Carrington class event that kills people for us to realize that we need to make some changes because radiation storms are invisible killers and I'm actually more concerned about the radiation storms that are associated with things like Carrington class events or even events that are smaller than that. I'm more concerned about them than I am even about big CMEs and stuff like that because big CMEs are easy to see, they're easy to link up, they're easy to get over relatively speaking. But radiation storms, we don't see them. We don't even know they're happening. And, and we can't shield them out very easily. But some of the shields we use end up making bigger sources, making the problem worse as opposed to better. Um, and and uh, we, just, we just have a long way to go. So I was going to go into neutron monitors, but before I do that, let me just pause and see if there are any questions, because I know this class has been going on for quite some time. I'm actually going through this a lot sm slower, a lot more slowly than I thought I would. So, do you guys, let's see, how do, ast how do our astronauts get through the Van Allen belt? Quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, we, there are ways. I mean, oftentimes you launch, the, the Van Allen belts luckily are, are mostly equatorial. They don't 
cover the, the, the polar regions. Do we have to go through, no matter what, we have to go through some intense radiation, there's no doubt. But it doesn't last all that long. And we, all, we do have routes that allow us to minimize the amount of time spent in, in these dangerous regions. Um, there, are, there are many orbits that can be very hazardous. Um, and it's good that you ask about that because a lot of people think that space is space is space, right? Anywhere in space, it's all the same. No, it's not at all. And that's one of the trades that we do when we launch satellites, for example, in near-Earth space, is we have to make trades based on what the function of the spacecraft is to do, what the function of the payload is to do, and whether or not they can survive the orbit that they want to be in. Because some of these orbits that they want to be in are extremely dangerous. The GPS orbit, for example, is not fun. That is a, that is a not fun orbit, and there are a lot of things that go wrong in, in that orbit. Uh, especially to do with radiation. Geo, the geo environment is actually not fun either. That's why there's a lot of spacecraft charging in that particular environment. The low Earth orbit environment is actually not fun when it comes to things like drag, believe it or not. A big, a big Carrington class event is going to cause a buttload of satellites in low Earth orbit to fall out of the sky, literally. So Starlink, look out. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's going to be a fun, it's going to be a fun next solar cycle, I tell you, with that many, with so many Starlink satellites in orbit in low Earth orbit, uh, all we need is a really big uh, solar storm to hit and watch our atmosphere puff out and watch all these satellites with these big solar panels just slow down and, and, and suddenly drop because their, their orbit is being changed because they're slowing down uh, and watch them re-enter. It, 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 it's going to be an interesting time. Um, so because of that, there are a lot of different things that we have to worry about when it comes to trade space. You know, the amount of time you sit in a, you dwell in a, radi in a, in a high radiation environment um, is dictated by your path and your trajectory. It's also dictated by the fuel consumption. It's also dictated by um, your, um, uh, you know, obviously your trajectory and, and the instrument you're using or the, the uh, thruster, that, the style that you're using to get there. One of the reasons why the space station is in low Earth orbit is because it's a less in hostile environment when it comes to... Um, to radiation. The only time the, the space station has to deal with that is when it goes through what we call the South Atlantic, Atlantic Anomaly. And that's really the inner radiation belt. It kind of clips the edge of the inner radiation belts and it just ends up being this patch of bad area that maps down to, you know, basically over South America. But that's actually the, what we call the lower edge of the inner zone. And so it's a very dangerous place to be, not so much for humans. Um, it's not good for humans, but it's not so bad for humans. It's actually worse for avionics because it causes things like single event upsets and bit flips and stuff, which is a totally different class. Uh, but it's really, really high energy stuff. And, um, and the nature of radiation is that the higher energy it is, oftentimes the less energy it deposits in a soft part like a human. Um, the particle will go right through you. If you don't stop the particle, if you don't have enough mass to stop that particle inside you, it's not going to deposit as much energy and do as much damage to you than if it actually stopped. Okay? If it stops in you and you stop that particle, boy, it's, it, gives, it gives up all of its, it liberates all its energy inside your body. But if it's so energetic that it passes right through you, yeah, it'll do a little bit of damage to the ionization tract that goes through your body, but it's in and it's out and it's gone. So, um, it's kind of counterintuitive. You'd think that the higher energy stuff would do more damage to us, but it's actually not true. It's the lower energy stuff that can be a problem, the bigger problem. Um, and, um, and so the, the nice thing about the space station, for example, is that it's really well protected in our magnetic shield, and it's pretty much out of the radiation belts. It's just got that one section of really high energy stuff that it goes through, and that's not so bad for humans. Um, the issue that they have more has to do with solar storms when when that lights up the entire uh, near-Earth space and stuff, and then solar energetic particles hitting, that can cause problems for them too. But for the most part, uh, that's a pretty safe area. You would not want a space station in geo-orbit, for example. That could be, that could not be fun. Um, they already have issues with charging. I, I can't imagine a space station lasting very long in geo-orbit because of the size of it. There's a lot of spacecraft charging that goes on in geo because the radiation is a different kind. Um, but that's all about trapped radiation. That's a different class. But I will probably talk about that at some point. Hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> I know it's a, I'm really long-winded sometimes. I apologize. Um, do you think Fukushima is ever going to go away or can it be slowed down? 
you know, I'm not an expert in, in the nuclear uh, fallout for, from Fukushima. I, I'm grateful to Fukushima because people started carrying radiation detectors around them in flights, and they began to be aware of cosmic ray radiation and solar storm radiation because they, they flew up with these radiation detectors and went, oh my god, this is worse than Fukushima. And what they didn't realize is that it wasn't the fallout from the, radio, from the nuclear reactor. It was actually just co the natural cosmic ray radiation that you get at those altitudes. Um, so it woke a lot of people up to that, and I was very happy. Um, Tamitha, have you heard of the book Magnetic Reversals and Evolutionary Leaps, The True Origin of the Species by Robert Felix? No. He says that mutation from cosmic rays have been instrumental in our evolution. That does not surprise me one bit. Not one bit. Um, you know, because that, that does cause... Um, you know, changes in our in our DNA. Yeah, I, I've heard I've heard that theory before, so so it doesn't surprise me. I don't remember Robert Felix in particular, but I have heard that theory before, and it it, it absolutely makes sense to me. Um, Tamitha, what developments are we seeing to making gain to gain advance warning onto these radiation storms hitting? The advances that we have are very slow right now. The only thing that we really have is when a radiation storm is launched. Um, the electrons give us about 15 minutes to half an hour. Uh, you can look up the release model uh, that NASA has. And is it a great model? Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, but it only gives us a few minutes warning. Oftentimes, however, we know that these, we can tell if a radiation storm is going to hit um, and how bad it might be based on whether or not that, a bad actor on the sun has launched a radiation storm before and the position on the sun. If you watch the other courses uh, from this set of radiation storms, the courses um, talk about the difference between, let's say, an east limb, a flare going off, or a CME going off on the east limb with a radiation storm, and a radiation storm being launched from the west limb. And that has to do with the Parker spiral and how the paths of the particles are hit, So you'll how they hit Earth. So you'll see a bit, um, like when the Space Weather Prediction Center, for example, issues warnings or issues risks for radiation storms, mainly for things like satellite operators and stuff like that. They will, um, they will talk about this and they will, they will have the risk be higher when the bad actor that's on the sun firing off all this junk uh, is moving and rotating closer to the west limb. Uh, because that's, if it fires off a radiation storm, it's a much better chance that A, it will hit us, it will hit us fast and it will be very intense. If it launches a radiation storm off the east limb, it takes a while for that stuff to what we call cross field diffuse to get to Earth because it's having to cross the Parker Field's arms. It's not being able to spiral along the field lines and just get a straight line to us. It's actually having to leapfrog over these spiral arms, and it that it doesn't like doing that. Um, that's that's a hard thing to do. So it takes it longer for the the radiation storm to hit us. So we'll have a longer warning. But as far as predicting these things yet, not really. And the sad thing is that there's a lot of junk between the sun and Earth in interplanetary space that then can make the signatures of these, of these storms crazy. So um, we have a long way to go. We're trying to, to work with models and things like that, but we are decades off, I think, from being able to have any, any really robust um, attempt at, at, geez, at modeling coronal mass ejections coming off of the sun, let alone you know, for forecasting, let alone radiation storms that come with them. Um, sorry, I wish I, I wish I could tell you we're further along, but we're really not. Think of terrestrial weather, but back in 1960, <laughs> and that's where we are. So, the Sapphire Project can mitigate radiation. Yeah, they're working on it. They're working on stuff, um, and I'm very happy about that. I'm also happy about all the the vests and and armor that that um, uh, there's a lot of people that are trying to make body armor for potential um, lunar colonies and 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 others, uh, it's just intergalactic, or not intergalactic, but in, in interplanetary space travel. And, um, and there's, so there's, a, there's a, a, just a ton of work being done very rapidly in that region. And I have to thank the commercial space um, it, you know, industry for helping ramp up the work on that. But we are, we are still, our, our desirements are still far beyond what we're capable of doing thus far, yeah, and I just hope we just stay at it, so. Pole reversal in the sun, space weather connection. Totally different class, Stu. Um, I will do something, when I, when I talk about the Earth's magnetic shield and how it works and what it does, that's when I'll go into to that uh, with the pole reversal. If you're talking about um, Earth's pole reversal, 
Uh, if you're talking about the sun's pole reversal, I'll talk about that one when I do the solar activity cycle, which will be in the next couple classes or so. Um, but yeah, the, the Earth's magnetic shield and how it's going to reverse and what's going on there and how that connects with space weather is a really fascinating topic that um, not many of us understand yet because we don't, there's not too many people who are working on what the Earth's magnetic field is going to look like when, when the dipole field switch, you know, reverses, as it reverses. We have a multipolar sun at that point, uh, which I won't go into the details, but um, not, not now. But it's going to be very, very interesting. You're not going to have two poles. We're going to have more than that. At least pro probably at least four, because the, the quadrupole field will take over. But then the octopole field might actually be strong too. Will we even have radiation belts? Mm, maybe not. Um, it's going to be really different, <laughs> really different. Okay. Any other question? I think they could come up with a way to survive the radiation on Mars, but the bigger problem I see, at least, is health is low gravity. The radiation problem on Mars is a, pro is a big problem because the radiation on Mars gets all the way to the ground. And people want to have these long-term colonies, and you can't live in a box. You're going to have to live underground to a great degree to survive just the galactic cosmic ray radiation on a, on a long time scale, let alone solar radiation when it hits. You know, it's, you're constantly being rained down. The primary particles are hitting the surface on Mars all the time. And that was something that we've learned from the Curiosity rover is that, oh my gosh, the radiation doses on Mars, is, this is non-trivial. Um, and we've been led to believe that it's you know, terrestrial weather on Mars and the dust clouds and all that stuff that's a big problem, or low gravity that's a problem. I don't think so. I think the radiation, um, you know, we don't even know how plants are going to be able to go. How is agriculture going to work uh, on Mars with those radiation doses? Do we have a lot of studies on that stuff yet? I don't know. We have a little bit of agriculture uh, and, and growth of plants and stuff in, in zero G in space shuttle. But what about the dose, you know, the long-term radiation dose in space on crops, right? We're talking about, you know, cosmic ray mutations of humans causing evolution. What's it going to do to crops, right? Um, there's just so many unbelievably unanswered questions when it comes to colonizing other worlds. And, and again, radiation is the, the invisible killer. It's the thing that nobody sees. So it's the last to be looked at because nobody sees it. Nobody thinks to look at it because they don't see it. Gravity has been an issue we've dealt with for ages. Um, and, and I think we have a lot more people working on solving the lingering issues of gravity uh, and low gravity um, on, on the human um, body. But we just don't have a lot of people working on radiation. So, and on top of that, you can't do testing with radiation on humans. <laughs> I mean, you'll kill them. So it's a lot harder to do those types of experiments. Low gravity experiments on humans, well, okay, you know, you can do it with astronauts. They deal with it all the time. But trying to do a radiation study on, on humans, you can't. It's not reversible. The damage you do is permanent. So it's, it's just harder in every, in every measure, in every aspect. And that's why I think it's going to take longer to solve. And that's why I think it's a bigger and more pernicious problem than, we, than a lot of people give it credit for. So that's why. Um, hopefully that answered that question. Okay, putting scientific instruments into shipping containers, that's a great idea. Talk about thinking outside the box. I, 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 I'm obviously I've caught into a, a conversation you guys are having, that's cool. Um, Elon Musk having nothing with Mars, it's all about Karen events. You mean uh, Carrington events? Uh, I don't, you know, Elon Musk, he has his own agenda and, and, and I'm, I, more power to him because he doesn't want anything to stop it. And I get it. Momentum is everything. So he's going to push solve problems that he can't solve aside and say they're a non-problem because he just has to get there. Because if he can take that machete and whack through the weeds and get us there, then the path has been created. Okay, if there's blood on the path, well, there's blood on the path. He has his, his path and he wants to get there and he doesn't want anybody to stop him. I get that and, and I commend him for that. My job is the opposite. My job is the voice of reason to say, okay, I love what you're doing, but whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, don't, don't run amok. Don't, don't run so far into the weeds that, that you know, a, a whole army of people follow you and they all die. <laughs> Let's not do that. So his job is to push forward and push forward and push forward, be damned the consequences. And my job is to rein in, rein in, rein in. And somewhere between his mindset and my mindset, we'll find the balance, right? 
And then that's how you make great progress, right? As you kind of work as a team, even if it's a tense team, even if it's a team that, that is a bit antagonistic toward one another, you need that. You need that to be able to push forward, push the envelope and not get so, so careful that you, you paralyze yourself into non-movement. But then also not be so damn cavalier that you run, you know, part, part of my phrase, balls out toward, you know, your doom, right? Toward some, some catastrophic, cataclysmic nightmare that you can't then back away from. You need both of those forces, that, that yin and yang, that tug and pull, to be able to, to really make um, strong efforts. And it's the same thing with fringe science, by the way, fringe and, and, um, and mainstream science. You know, there's that same kind of tension. You've got, there, they can be a bit, the two fields can be kind of antagonistic, but also not, but also be protagonistic toward one another. And it's that tension oftentimes that ends up driving really great innovation. So I, I you know, I celebrate and, and, uh, and encourage people like Elon Musk and the commercial industry to do what they do and keep on that focus. And that way, people like me can help kind of rein them in, um, but also not, not cause them to pull back so far that, that everything comes to a grinding halt. Because that's not our job either. You know, none of us want that. We all want to push forward into space. But we don't want the scientists leading everything, because if the scientists lead everything, then nothing's going to be safe enough to go anywhere. <laughs> um, and I've seen that in aerospace, where engineers, if engineers run everything, um, then nothing is good enough to launch. <laughs> and yet, if the program offices and all the, the commercial industry that want to have this stuff done, if they, learn, if they run everything and they're allowed to, to make all the decisions, then everything that launches fails. <laughs> so you've got to have that, that dialogue, as uneasy as that dialogue may be. You have to have that dialogue in order for, and, and that kind of tension, in order to really create a nice balance and a nice synergy that then really propels you forward. So hopefully that answered that question. Um, let's see, okay, my, f my physics teacher told me magnets have a north and a south, I laughed. Well, you shouldn't laugh, they have a north and a south pole, that's how magnetic fields work, uh, at least a dipole magnetic field, and that's really what the Earth is, it's a big dipole magnet. But the dipole portion of Earth's magnetic field is just one, what we call one component. Um, it's a, it's the solution for Earth's magnetic field is actually many components stacked on top of each other. The strongest component is the dipole component. Then you have the quadrupole component. So the dipole component has two poles, north and south. Quadrupole component has what? Four poles, quadrupole, four poles. The octopole component, you can imagine, eight poles, right? Every single one of these components, and then you get higher and higher and higher harmonics. But each one of these components add to the, add to the overall field, but those components are smaller and smaller and smaller in strength. So the dipole component is the one that's really acting and it's strong and it's not flipping, it's not moving. Then that's really the main component and almost the only component you see. You don't see the you don't see the other components added together. Uh, it's, I, I always, oftentimes, call it like a bathtub, a dirty bathtub, like because I have a kid, right? So um, you have a bathtub full of bathtub toys, but the water's murky because it's all soapy and stuff. So you can't see the toys that are underneath the water. All you can see is the top of the water. As you drain that water out, then the toys begin to emerge. The bigger toys emerge first than the smaller toys, right? Same kind of thing. As the dipole field flips, it's kind of like draining that bathtub. So as the, the water drains and that dipole field begins to go to zero right before it flips and starts growing the other way, um, you're going to start. You're going to start exposing the other toys, the toys in the water. First the bigger toys, so the quadrupole component, then the smaller toys, the octopole, you know, and then higher harmonics after that. Um, and so when the dipole field of our Earth flips over, or, or right before it flips, right as it's flipping, it goes to zero, and we will have mainly a quadrupole field that will have four poles, but you might actually see some effect from the octopole field as well. It's really hard to say. But it's going to be a much more complicated Earth's ma magnetic shield will be much more complicated than it is today. It will be smaller, but it won't be gone. So hopefully that, that answers that question. Um, okay. Our sun has four magnetic fields. Our sun has the same kind of thing as Earth. It's a multipolar sun. So the dipole component is the main component that you see. But notice, right when the dipole field of the sun is flipping, believe it or not, that's solar maximum. And that's why at solar maximum you see coronal mass ejections and solar storms coming off of all angles. I mean, they're coming off of the North Pole, the South Pole. They're coming off of all latitudes and longitudes because we have what we call a multipolar sun. 
at solar minimum, that's when the dipole field of the sun is its most well formed, like now. And so where we see coronal mass ejections and big solar storms coming is right about the equator. We don't see them launching nearly as much from the poles so because, because it's a much more ordered magnetic field. But that's part of the solar activity cycle um, talk that I'll give in a, a couple talks from now. So we'll get into all that. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll, that's an interesting idea. Depends upon how long the, that's an interesting idea. Maybe. Depends upon how long the talks will be. Maybe I'll couple together Earth's magnetic field flipping with the sun's field flipping and talk about the similarities and differences. That's a, I hadn't thought of that before. That's a neat juxtaposition. It might be instructive. I'll think about that. Um, okay. Why does the sun cos cosmic wind appear to occasionally reverse direction? The sun's cosmic wind? First of all, I know the sun's solar wind, not cosmic wind. And the solar wind never reverses direction. It's always blowing outward from the sun because it's the sun's atmosphere being exploded off. Um, there are components of the sun that kind of, you know, the, the, the solar wind can actually get distorted or something, especially if there's a big transient. And there can be rarefactions that change a relative aspect of the solar wind speed. But it's still blowing off the sun. At, uh, even the slow solar wind is 300 kilometers a second. Um, at least at Earth. So if you're talking about maybe switchbacks that Parker Solar Probe is seeing near the sun, near right at the sun, well, that's a new finding. And that those switchbacks have to do with these jets that are creating the slow solar wind. We're just beginning to learn about how that all happens. It's a it's pretty exciting time for, for solar and space physics right now. But that, that's not something I can answer in this class. Um, drain the swamp. Cute. Very cute. OK. Starlink is the holy grail of the internet coming to a planet near you. Could be. Could be. Um, we'll see how well it fares during the first big solar storm when, you know, all, when each spacecraft has to be cross-linked with three of its nearest neighbors. And then suddenly the big solar storm comes and all of them fall into radically different orbits. And now their cross-links are locked and even the ground tracks are, locked, are lost because they don't know where the, the satellites are. They've lost them. Uh, and then they have to reacquire them. We'll see how long, how big the outages, the internet outages are, uh, and and how well how well that works out. We'll we'll just see. I, I think Elon Musk is not so worried about the success of of Starlink in the long term um, with this first set of constellations, but rather setting the precedent and saying these frequencies are mine, and and basically getting dibs. Um, I think that's what's more important to him. There's other couple other things that are more important to him too. But I, I don't think, um, once again, it's that same kind of attitude of, I don't care if they succeed, I just need to set the precedent. It's that same kind of thing charging off into the woods. That's his mindset, and that's fine. It's, it's his agenda, and I get it. But it, the space weather consequences of that are going to be hilarious, I think, here in the coming years. Um, try not to trigger your short bus students. Some determine what cycle event that's coming will catastrophe on the horizon. Oh, who knows? Oh, and I'm, yeah, corona. Yeah, I know. The corona, the sun, the corona, the coronavirus. It's terrible, isn't it? Um, Tamitha is such a guilty pleasure. <laughs> I should be writing on a very remotely connected matters. And oh, well, her lectures will keep me sane. Oh, <laughs> good. I'm glad. Thank you, Scott. That's, I appreciate the compliment. OK. I think I got, yeah, I know. I know. Starlink is a four-letter word in astronomy circles, and I don't blame you. Um, one nice thing is. Uh, I think the paints that make Starlink satellite shiny, I think the, the, the oxygen, um, there's oxygen up there in low Earth orbit, and there's what we call oxygen erosion. Um, there's a good chance, and keep your fingers crossed, that over time, uh, a few months to, to maybe even a year, uh, the coatings will stop being so shiny. And it's just simply because the space, you know, again, space weather is hazardous. And so because of the oxygen erosion up there, uh, there's a there is a good chance that you're going to see all of those those nice you know ceramic looking paints uh, kind of become dull over time and so they won't reflect light nearly as well and I'm just praying for that I mean there's there's arguments that it could go either way um, depends upon what the paint that they're using um, <laughs> one of my colleagues has refused to talk to Elon <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, the joys of working at aerospace. Um, there are colleagues of mine who've been asked to talk uh, 
to Elon Musk about what they should be painting their, their um, painting the outside of their satellites. And some of my colleagues are like, I am not even. I am not going there. I do not want to get involved with this at all. So it's it, at least no, from a comical point of view, at least no Elon's working on it. He's trying to get the right people on the project. Whether or not those people are willing to work with him is a totally different subject. But he at least is trying to solve that issue. Um, it's a non-trivial issue to solve, but it's, it's, it does lead me to a few funny stories that I'm sorry, but I can't share uh, just because it's proprietary stuff, but uh, just some funny stuff. He is working on trying to solve that problem, so just know. He, he, you know he's not all bad. Um, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, best to stay out of that conversation. I agree. Okay, are, are you guys ready? I mean, I've now talked, let's see, 11 to 12. Oh, my gosh, it's almost 2 o'clock. Maybe I should save neutron monitors till next time. Good night. You guys have kept me answering a lot of questions, haven't you? Um, how much do I have? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight charts on neutron monitors. Oh, do you guys want me to continue or should I call it a day? You guys got to tell me. My voice is a little tired, but I could, I could maybe go through some of this quickly. I can't believe you've got to get me on for three hours already. <laughs> Man, time flies. Um, let me know. The, what I, just so you know, what I would talk about with neutron monitors really is kind of how you detect them. And I could go through them reasonably fast. I don't have a lot of detail on neutron monitors, but I just have enough detail to let you know um, really how they're non-trivial uh, to, to look at neutron monitor data and, and think that you know what's happening. Earth's magnetic field, and I'll go into this more, I believe, when I talk about Earth's magnetic shield. Because Earth's magnetic shield is actually quite complicated. And, and the way it's constructed, it's just a dipole magnet, essentially. But it's pulled out in, in the back, um, just like you know we talk about the heliosphere being pulled out uh, into, a, into a tail-like thing. The Earth's magnetic shield is the same way. And that facilitates certain types of particle entry, and it inhibits others, and different areas of the shield dictate where particles can enter and not. And then add on top of that the fact that all these cosmic rays are, are charged particles, and so they spiral along magnetic field. They see the magnetic field, and they have gyrate, what we call um, gyro motion around these field lines. So that changes how they enter and what their particle motions are. And oh my gosh, particle motion inside Earth's magnetic shield, even in the radiation belts, uh, can get really, really crazy. Um, and, and so this part of the talk is really just to kind of talk about how non-trivial um, neutron monitors are in terms of their detection of these particles. So, okay, present tomorrow. I'm not going to present tomorrow. You'd have to wait an entire month. So what I might do, I'm seeing people that are saying, I'm, yeah, next time is good. I'm seeing some people, okay, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's what I'll do. Um, you're, you're, you just went, you just disappeared off the screen, so I didn't catch your name. But I think I, I'm seeing people saying, some people saying yes, keep going. Some people saying no, um, um, I've got to go. Trust me, I'm not expecting you to stay on for three hours. <laughs> the fact that I end up staying on for three hours is just because I know some people come on and some people log off, blah, blah, blah. And that's why I usually give a little bit of a review of the stuff that I talked about at the end of last course in the current course so that people can not only get caught up, but those who had to log off early um, can rejoin. So what I'll do is I'll probably do the same thing here. I'll give a quick overview of the neutron monitor stuff, and then I'll go into it again uh, a little bit next time. Okay, so those of you who need to drop off, please feel free. Thank you so much for your time, um, and I hope you enjoyed the class, and thank you for all of the fantastic questions thus far. It's been great. Um, so those of you who want to continue, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Charles. I see you. You want me to continue. Um, and yeah, okay. Very good. Let's see. Um, so di so much to digest already in this presentation. So yeah, feel free to you know check the the replay, and I will do a, a quick overview of this, and then and then I will also include it in maybe more detail next time. But for those of you who are sticking with me, really, uh, neutron monitors are one of the earliest ways we learned how to discover and, and talk and and. Um, detect cosmic rays. We 
remember, the particles that are coming down from space are mainly uh, uh, protons, but they create these cosmic ray showers, and some of these other secondary particles actually make it to the ground. And we are able to detect them um, using things like neutron monitors. Now, we first did it with ion, ion counters and gauges and things like that, and I don't really know the physics. I can't remember. I, I know I learned it in, in my physics classes, but it was so long ago that I, I don't recall all of the physics of the neutron mon of the um, ion gauge counters. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about neutron monitors because these are the things that we use today. Okay, And basically, they're pretty simple. Um, they're polyurethane, lead, and boron counters. They're in these big tubes. They have to have a decent size. As you can see, these are in shipping containers. Someone mentioned having instruments in shipping. Whoops, pardon me, I'm on the wrong side. Um, some, someone mentioned having instruments in shipping containers, and that's exactly what they do with, uh, with neutron monitors. They put them in there, um, oftentimes not because they're expecting, don't worry, there's not going to be a new cosmic ray shower coming through that. The secondary particles are not going to create a new cosmic ray shower through the metal container. It's the primary particles, the protons, let's say, that cause that, and that happened way up in the atmosphere. So the primary particles are gone. So it's okay to put these things in metal containers now because they're not going to create a secondary shower. Uh, you don't have to worry about that because, like I said, the big particles are all gone. So, so they have these big boron tubes and polyurethane, and they're able to detect, and I'm not going to go into the de details of the physics of how they detect them. I just wanted you to see how big they are. But they're, the nice thing is that because they, they are big, they have to be like, you know, big box car size things because you're, you're detecting a small amount of flux, you know, these secondary particles. There are not a lot of them that hit the ground at one time. Um, but uh, they are very simple. And so there's a load of them all over the world. Here are a few. <laughs> yeah, some of them, now some of them aren't functioning anymore, uh, not because they don't exist, but because there's not enough money to run them. Remember, scientists pay for all of this through their grants and stuff like that. So to be able to monitor all of this stuff, um, you know, is, is wonderful as long as you have money. But some of them do get shut down. I think the South Pole was one of the ones we got very frustrated. I think the South Pole is shut down. There's a few others that have been shut down over time. Um, but there's still a, a, a quite a large set of them that are um, up and functioning. And more being created, you know, not all the time, but they are being created from time to time, especially as cosmic ray studies become even more important. Um, but the thing is that with cosmic rays or cosmic ray monitors, you'd think, just like any instrument, where the detector is in latitude or longitude on the, on the planet, that's where that cosmic ray penetrated. And that's not necessarily true. Okay. Here's why neutron monitors are so complicated. And why you can't take you can't take them any of the data that you see from them um, trivially. Okay. Let me go over here. Because of Earth's magnetic shield, right, I told you it was complicated. And I told you that when cosmic rays come in through the Earth's magnetic shield, these, proto these particles, they're gyrating around these magnetic fields in very complicated ways. And that means that a cosmic ray that enters the Earth's shield from one place ends up spiraling all around and hitting the Earth and you know, penetrating into the Earth's atmosphere somewhere else. And so we have this concept of an asymptotic um, viewing cone when it comes to, and here's a couple examples. Um, so if you're, you're looking here at, at the neutron monitors in Berensburg and Apatiti, see, see where they are? See the little circles? Whoops, hang on, let me get my hand in the right place. So there's a little circle here for Berensburg and this circle for Apatiti. Okay. You'd think, okay, well, the cosmic rays are coming in from you know, some angle hitting, hitting them there, right? The problem is, is that cosmic rays can actually enter the Earth's magnetic shield. Now, this is a big simplification of the Earth's magnetic shield. Um, it's, they're just showing it as a ball. We know it's not a ball, but they're talking about the edge. The magnetopause is the, the edge, essentially, of the Earth's magnetic shield. They're just drawing it as a simple dashed line. And if the particle enters over here, well, if you try to map that, that cone of the particles that you can actually see entering, not only do you have particles of different energies mapping to slightly different locations, okay, but they're nowhere near where the actual um, monitor actually is. In this case for Barentsburg, if you have particles entering the magnetosphere over here, 
with different energies, 1 GeV or 1 GeV and 20 GeV, um, that there's so there's different energies, okay? They're entering in slightly different locations. But as you map that down doing some very fancy mathematics, you end up getting a cone that maps to the surface of Earth over here. That's where that little red thing is. Gosh, if I can get my hand in the right place. See it? Not completely over the monitor, is it? And that's an easy one because that's near the pole. <laughs> that's where the field lines are pretty straight, they're pretty open, they go straight down. Imagine as you get a little bit further down, a little bit further down, how much worse it can get. Look at this. In this case, here's Apatiti. So you see, you see where Apatiti is over here, right? Uh, right here. Okay, Apatiti, here's the circle, right? That's where the monitor is. But look at its asymptotic cone. Not only does it have a big energy smear from 20 GeV all the way down to 1, one GeV. I keep saying GeV, it's GeV, gigavolts, okay? There's a conversion to do with GeV, um, giga and electron volts to gigavolts, but I'm not going to go through that exercise with you. Um, but just suffice to say that these are higher energies than these. So there's a smear in energy, but look where this, where they enter the Earth's magnetic shield, and then look where they map to. Okay. So when you take this swath here on the magnetic shield, on our magnetic shield, and if you were to map it straight down, look, look where you're mapping. Look where the cone maps. Oh my God. So the particle mapping, really, the particles came from a totally different location outside the Earth's magnetic shield than where they ended up entering and landing. See at Apatiti? They end up hitting Apatiti up here, but they actually entered the Earth's magnetic shield in a straight map that would be over here somewhere. Okay? So it's non-trivial, and this happens for all of them. Look at this. Here is for Spaceship Earth. This is, this is, a, set, this is a set of neutron monitors that have been run by the University of Delaware at the Bartol Research Institute, and originally led by John Bieber, who's a good friend of mine, um, a really fantastic and oh, just brilliant physicist. He's now since retired, and I think his, most of his colleagues, um, most of the colleagues that I knew are, are also retired, but um, they still run Spaceship Earth, and it's really neat because they have all these neutron monitors all over the globe that they keep up and running, and they're able to look at cosmic rays all over the Earth, right? Um, and they are very savvy mapping out what these asymptotic viewing cones are. So here is a, a, a plot, for example, of their um, stations, and you can see the stations, Baltar Station, the Russian Station, you see all these different stations in here. They all have names, um, you know, Apatiti, Norilsk, um, Thule. There's a whole bunch of them, and I, I don't have that. You'll see, I'll show you a, a list of them here in a minute. But on top of that, you also have their asymptotic viewing cones. So, like, for instance, if I go up here, you can see Apatiti, right? It's up here in, what is this, Finland, Norway area, up here in Sweden area, right? So that's the actual physical station of Apatiti. But look over here. Here's where its viewing cone is. See AP, AP with a square? See that? Okay, Norilsk is up over here, NO, right here. Look at its viewing cone. See? So, and that goes on and on and on. You can look at all of these stations and see where the actual physical station is, may or may not be where its viewing cone is. So it's a bit tricky. and. Even for my Millersville students, I didn't really go into the details of things like, um, you know, the geomagnetic cutoff and stuff like that. I probably will do that when I talk about Earth's magnetic shield. It gets way too complicated to talk about it. What I want to impress upon you, though, is that when you see people using neutron monitor data to talk about cosmic rays or radiation storms or anything else, looks can be deceiving. Don't think that you can take a station here and say, well, this is exactly where, where the cosmic rays are coming from, or this is exactly what's going on. And you take this station and you compare it to that station, and you're expecting that they should be equivalent because they're both nearby one another. When in actuality, their viewing cones may be radically different. And so when you see discrepancies between different stations, it may not be as trivial as what you think it is, just simply looking at their location on a map. Okay? 
you really need to be savvy when you're when you're using neutron monitor data. You need it's it, you could get a PhD just in this. So people need to be very very careful, especially when I see um, uh, hobbyists using neutron monitors. I just kind of wince because it's like, okay, guys, uh, are you aware <laughs> that it's not that easy to use neutron monitor data? They're great for um, you know if, if you don't know what you're doing, they're great to get an idea of what's going on. But once you start trying to intercalibrate or intercorrelate, you know, different neutron monitor stations and trying to talk about things that are happening on the planet itself, it becomes very, very complicated very, very quickly. This is why I don't think, this is just one of the many reasons why I don't think the whole concept of cloud seeding, for example, is settled. Neutron monitor data is how we get information about ground level events, cosmic rays and ground level events from solar radiation storms. And yet, the data is extremely tricky to use. And so unless you're really well schooled in it, you could misuse the data very rapidly. And, and that's, that's a problem. So, let's see, do I have, yeah. Okay, I, I guess I can put them both together. Asymptotic viewing cones do change. So here's an example, um, I'll stand on this side. You can see on this map here, here's, you know, here's all the stations and, and you can see the, the names of them. So here's South Pole, SP, Terry, Adelaida, TA, Fort Smith, ULU. I mean, they all have their own um, uh, very well-known uh, acronyms. Okay, and you can see them mapped all over. And by now, you you are, you know, you know what the viewing cones are. Okay, but remember the Earth rotates, right? The Earth's magnetic shield changes a little as you're rotating, and the solar wind is always blowing in the same direction. So even though the magnetic field is kind of tilting, and we also have seasonal variations, right? Because the magnetic field is the tilting with the Earth, right? And the Earth is tilted depending upon where they are in the seasons. So all of those variations have to be taken into effect when you're talking about what the viewing cone is. And so that means viewing cones do not stay the same. So as I stand out here and I look, for example, at, let's just grab one, Thule, okay? Thule is TL. Over here, here's Thule over here, okay. Whoops, I'm too far over. Sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Here's Thule. Here's, you see that line going from, looks like Greenland to, you know, middle of Europe or something, right? That's up here. And now look at Thule again over here. <laughs> so I stand way off to the edge. Look at Thule here. Now it's in T-H-U-L. It's in kind of a dark crimson. Now it goes from Greenland all the way back down over here to South Africa. <laughs> Didn't go to Europe. Where the hell is it going? <laughs> okay, and you can see that for a lot of other stations as well. Asymptotic viewing cones do not stay the same. You need to be able to know how to calculate them. So each event, like a ground level event or something, which I'll show you in a second, every event that happens where you're using these stations, you need to be able to know what the asymptotic viewing cone is for that particular event. And that's, again, another layer of complexity that makes it difficult to use neutron monitor data unless you really know what you're doing. Now, let's talk about where neutron monitors are fantastic, irrespective of um, where they are. Let's talk about a big CME, a big solar storm. Remember, big solar storms, are they're massive, right? The Earth is like a needle in a haystack when it goes through one of these structures because they're just so incredibly massive. Coronal mass ejections can be by the time they hit Earth, can be a quarter of the distance from the sun to the Earth. They can be that, that wide. By the time they hit Earth, that's how wide they can be, is a quarter of the distance from the sun to the Earth. I've seen them that way. I mean, these things can be absolutely massive. Um, and, and so Earth is like not even a pinprick through one of these structures, which means that you're suddenly encapsulated in a very large bottle, right, a magnetic bottle when these things come out. So here's an example of the sun and a CME being launched from the sun, all right? And you have galactic cosmic rays coming in at Earth all the time from all sorts of directions, right? And that's what, you're show that's what they're showing from all these little arrows. You're in a bath of them, right? But as this magnetic bottle that's got closed magnetic field, meaning the field is locked in. Now, solar radiation storms, are they're being channeled from the sun through all these fields, right? And through the shock wave and all that stuff because it's coming from the source. It's connected to the sun. so. So everything that the sun is driving out is being kind of funneled into this 
structure or around the structure in, in the fields that are connected to the structure and everything associated with it. So for solar radiation storms, a CME is great. It kind of really helps encapsulate and energize the, solar, the radiation storms from the sun, right, as you can see. But what about for sources outside the sun, like cosmic rays? Well, this is what happens. You have this closed magnetic structure getting bigger and bigger and bigger and enveloping the Earth. But galactic cosmic rays find they can't penetrate very well. So suddenly the galactic cosmic ray intensity goes way down. Okay? And those were seen in the 1940s by a guy named Scott Forbush. And he called them Forbush. They were, they were named Forbush decreases. Here's an example of one. Here's neutron monitors. These remember the October, November radiation storms and stuff we saw from uh, during the, the, the um, that I showed you on the chronographs, <sighs> all the, the blizzards, right? Well, the, at Earth, at an, in a neutron monitor, those events look like this. See the see the GLE, ground level event. Okay, these are the solar radiation storms that were so strong. Remember, I told you how strong they were. They tore up the ozone hole for or, or tore up the ozone for eight months. They were so strong that they were detected on the ground by neutron monitors. The cosmic ray shower, the solar radiation storm shower, was so intense from these particles that it actually created an intensification in the neutron monitors from these radiation storms. Now granted, not that big, but still big enough, easy to see, right? Look at them, okay? But then what happened a few days later? What do you think happened? That big coronal mass ejection that was locked into this hit Earth, right? And what does it look like? This. So while the radiation storm is now dying, because as soon as that shock wave passes Earth, the radiation storm begins to die. Okay, so the GLE continues until that CME hits. But once that CME hits, so you see those GLE effects, you can see them shaded. Once that CME hits and the shock wave passes, now you're inside a magnetic bottle. And what happens to the, to the particles, the secondary particles from all the cosmic rays that are supposed to be hitting you? Whew. Right off the map. Boom. Look at that. All of those monitors, it doesn't even matter. Barentsburg, Apatiti, Ulu. You can look at any of them. Any of them. Why? Because Earth is completely engulfed in this CME. Right? So that means that no cosmic, well, not no cosmic rays, but a significant number of cosmic rays from any viewing cone any angle trying to enter Earth's magnetic shield gets knocked out. And that was one of the cool things that's, that we learned when, when we started putting together the idea that solar flares were firing off these things and causing radiation storms. But what the hell was this? <laughs> what is this big hole? What is this big magnetic bottle that's shielding out the cosmic rays? It took us quite a while. It took us decades to figure out what that was. But we started putting it together. These are magnetic bottles that the sun is firing. And it's shielding us. What actually steers cosmic or, uh, solar radiation storms into Earth and helps facilitate making solar or radiation storms worse or makes cosmic rays better. <laughs> it's kind of, you see how complicated the physics is? It's kind of neat though. And you can see here's another effect, um, the other GLE from, this was the, 20, the radiation storm on the 29th. Right, right there. And then you got the other one on the 3rd. And I showed all of those in the, in the chronograph. You saw the pss, 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 three times. Those are they. Boom, boom, boom. All those three shadings. And then that CME hit Earth in the middle of all that. But notice that even in the forebush, in the dip, in the depths of the forebush decrease, you're still getting the solar radiation storm. Okay? So what forebush decreases do, what CMEs do, is they facilitate the entry of, of solar radiation storms into the Earth, into the Earth's magnetic shield but they inhibit galactic cosmic rays. Kind of neat, huh? Isn't space weather fun? Are you confused enough yet? <laughs> and then if it's not complicated enough, and here's pretty much where I'm going to quit, these big magnetic bottles that are, are these, sol these big solar storms, they're fascinating because as as they launch from the sun, you know, they, they cause these ground level events because you, you can actually get, with the really strong radiation storms, the cosmic ray showers are so intense, or I should just say that the radiation showers are so intense that they 
are detected on the ground at neutron monitors, um, just because there's just the flux is so high. Uh, I should also give you another indication of poor airline passengers who are having to fly, you know, during these big radiation storms. If you can detect an increase in a neutron monitor from the particles hitting the ground, imagine what the, the people are feeling in the planes. You know, talk about the invisible killer. They're getting bombarded and they don't even know it. Uh, it's sad. Um, anyway, uh, it, it's just something that's got to change. Uh, anyway, when you get these big magnetic bottles, imagine as they pass Earth in this case. Okay, so here you see the sun. You can see the, 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 he put a flare, but this is the big CME that's coming out, the big solar storm that's coming out. And here's Earth on the backside. So this, this, this CME basically missed Earth. So we didn't get hit by the solar storm. But we actually do get hit. You know, we might have actually seen the Forbush decrease, right? But here's the cool thing, is that in this particular event, this is the October 28th, 2003. This is one of those Halloween storms we were talking about. The funny thing was that with Spaceship Earth, they could actually tell that with the ground level event from the, from the solar radiation storm, that the particles actually came in the night side of Earth. It came up from behind. So even though it shielded out the cosmic rays, the solar radiation storm didn't come from, didn't seem to come from the sun because the, the solar storm, the, the, the magnetic field from this, this coronal mass ejection actually caused the high energy part of protons to spiral around the front end, the nose of this thing, and enter the, the Earth's magnetic shield from the tail. So from that long comet tail, remember I told you how sometimes the particles can come up from the back? Here's a classic example of when they came up from the back big time. And with Spaceship Earth, they were able to tell that the cosmic ray monitors on the day side didn't get the big GLE. They didn't get the big radiation storm event on the ground, but they got it, the night side monitors did. And so they had to figure out how in the world is that possible? And they realized, oh, when the because they, they found that the solar storm, the CME, went just to the east of Earth. And yet we still got hit by that radiation storm, but it, we got hit from the backside. So cosmic rays are, are I mean, not cosmic rays, neutron monitors are very useful if you know how to use them. They can tell you so much about what we call anisotropies um, and, and how, radiation part, how radiation storms work and how they, they meander around different fields in the in the solar wind. It's not just always a Parker spiral where the particles hit from one angle or another. You can have these magnetic bottles that do all sorts of weird things to change things. And that's what makes neutron monitors fantastic is because you have a, a it's like a set of, of instruments that uh, particle detectors that are as l the size of the earth <laughs> suddenly. And so we're actually able to dis disseminate and, and, and distinguish between front side and back side. And that's what a lot of these other spacecraft, as they look at these, um, these radiation storms or even cosmic rays, they're not able to do. Now, sometimes at, inside the Earth's magnetic shield, we are able to discern some of that. Sometimes we get, um, with certain really expensive particle instruments that spin, we're able to see what we call these anisotropies, like stronger particle incidents on one side or the other side or something like that. But really, out in interplanetary space, it's hard to do. And so neutron monitors can be extremely useful to help us from that point of view, simply because they've got the resolution, you know, they, base, they have the, the geometric size of the Earth to help with that distinguishing, you know, instead of being this tiny little spacecraft that every angle looks the same. Um, so I don't want to bag on, on neutron monitors, because um, even though they're complicated, uh, they, they really can make a big difference. And, and they, they do have a role to play in all of this, both in solar radiation storms and also in, in cosmic rays. And here's kind of what I was showing you again. So you can have, um, in this picture here, here's the coronal mass ejection, the big solar storm, and here's what we typically see with the, the, um, the radial, you know, the, the Parker spiral field coming out. Don't worry about the arrows being backwards. That's just showing the magnetic field direction. The Parker spiral field coming out and then going out through that shock wave and if you're here at Earth, down here, right, the best way to get hit, you'd think by, uh, especially with a CME coming straight at you, the best way to get hit is from a source where you're actually getting the sources on the, on the west limb of the sun over here. 
because you get a straight line almost with those magnetic field lines to Earth. Okay? But here's an example how that can be deceiving, where you can actually have a CME launched that's to the east of you, and maybe it takes a little bit longer for the radiation storm to get to you, but those particles are actually coming off this way, but they're caught inside this magnetic bottle, and they can come in and actually hit Earth from behind. Two completely different scenarios, very hard to suss out, but they both are valid, and neutron monitors can really help us with that. So I think, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. So that's the end of that, and I'll probably go over some of that again uh, in, in greater detail in, in the next course. We'll, we'll see if you guys need me to. Um, but uh, that's all I have for today. I'm not going to go into trap radiation. That's all Earth's magnetic field. And I'll just have to say that for another course. So anybody have any questions? <laughs> Let's see, that's why the arrows indicating solar winds point towards the Earth on the backside. That, not the solar, we're talking about magnetic field. The arrows are indicating the magnetic field direction, not the, the, the solar wind blow direction. The solar winds are always blowing outward. It's the magnetic fields that, that, they're show, that is being shown this way, okay? And they're actually showing, um, in, in this case, in this diagram, they're showing magnetic field direction, not solar wind flow. This thing is always blowing out, okay? That's just magnetic field direction. And in here, in this diagram, it's actually showing what these are. These are HEP, meaning the high energy protons is the way they labeled them. It's really just the solar energetic particles, but they're talking about mainly the protons. And they're just showing the path of those protons as they're going around that magnetic bottle and going up the tail, <laughs> up the skirt <laughs> of Earth, so to speak. So. Yeah, don't get that confused with solar wind flow. The solar wind does not change flow. Of, the radial direction of the solar wind is always blowing outward from the sun, period. The radial magnetic field may go in or out, but the radial flow, the speed of that solar wind, it's always blowing parcels of solar wind outward toward the edge of the heliosphere. If, if it didn't, we wouldn't have a heliosphere. You know, the, suddenly the, or we, you know, our, our sun would be collapsing <laughs> and we'd be in a lot more trouble than, than just that. So telluric currents interact and or react. Are you talking about telluric currents on the, on the Earth? Um, that's a totally different conversation. Uh, but yes, we have, we have telluric currents on the Earth all the time, and they're really sensitive to geomagnetic storms. As a matter of fact, that's what um, SWPSI's trying to do when they do the, the mapping of the metal telluric. Oh, they're trying to talk about the um, GICs and the, the um, I think, are they mapping the electric field? I think they're mapping the electric field. It's a model. But they've gotten that through doing uh, magneto or magnetic telluric um, sounding of the different conductivities of the stones, of the, of the, the rocks, you know, the, the bed, the, the earth <laughs> underneath in different places, at least in the United States. Um, there's a lot of errors in that model. They didn't uh, account for solar storms. They continued their measurements during solar storms, which completely blows up all of their, their mathematics, but they, they didn't have time to be able to Pick, a, pick out solar storms. They had to map when they mapped. and Kind of sad, but it's a good first run um, to get us going. But yeah, um, all of those currents are very important. Really important to drilling, too. Not just to power grid companies, but also to people who drill for oil and fracking and all that other kind of stuff where they have to really drill and be very, very critical and very, very precise. Those magnetic fields mean everything. It, it throws them off big time um, if their estimates are wrong or if there's a big solar storm going on. Um, it, it, and yeah, because they can't afford having any issues with what with their um, uh, their magnetic readings, and um, and so that's a big field. There's a lot of money being put in that field now, as they understand more about it. You're welcome, guys. Uh, thank you for for joining us. Can neutrons have their own unique signature for tracking purposes? Oh, you neutrons! Neutrons are hard. And, and I'll go into neutrons, um, especially when I talk about energetic neutral atoms uh, that IBEX is, is um, measuring. Neutrons are, are hard because they're neutral, so they don't see electric and magnetic fields, and they don't obey anything. You can't even stop them. Neutrons are hard to stop. You need, like, bricks of material to stop neutrons, uh, which is something that I'm curious about when it comes to, these, to the um, colonists on the moon, especially if we have a neutron albedo coming out of the moon. Is that a low-dose issue that that we have not taken into consideration for long-term stays on the moon. See, once again, 
even though they're neutrons and they're neutral, um, that's still a form of radiation because they're subatomic particles, and that's, that's, they could be dangerous to biological activity. So that's something else we have yet to, to um, really dig into, and I don't think anybody's doing any work on that. Um, why isn't space hot as the sun's been burning for millions of years? Uh, because there's nothing to contain the heat. <laughs> the particles are collisionless. They can't even transfer heat. Part of the, the sun really is hot. It's 10 to the fourth Kelvin um, on average, the solar wind. The reason why if you were to go up in space and try to touch 10 to the fourth Kelvin uh, in degrees, it's not going to burn you because the particles aren't really touching you uh, because it's so vacuous. It's not any of the particles that do touch you. It's so vacuous, they're not transferring much heat to you, um, unlike a collisional atmosphere like ours that gets a lot of radiative, a lot of, lot of heat transfer. Um, that's why people wonder, they say, the aurora is so hot. Yeah, it is. It's hot, um, but it's basically collisionless. Once again, you're not talking about a collisional plasma, so if you were to touch your hand in there, you'd actually feel very cold um, because there's no transfer, there's no heat transfer. So temperature and heat are not the same thing, and it becomes much more complicated to, to intuitively understand that um, as you get into more and more vacuous types of, of plasmas, of, um, of gases and plasmas, because you... you lose the point of view that you have being down here in a collisional fluid. You know, the air is a collisional fluid for us. And so um, we take things, we take temperature and heat for granted as being almost, inter, you know, exchangeable, simply because of the conduction and stuff that we have, these processes of heat transfer that we have down here that do not exist in space, simply because it's so vacuous. There's, n there's nothing touching one another. So how do I get the heat from this one to transfer to this one? It doesn't work. <laughs> They're too far apart. Um, the mean free path of particles in space um, is essentially from, from here to the Earth. Uh, one particle might hit, might hit another by the time they get to Earth. It takes that long. You have to travel that far, one AU, one, one full Sun-Earth distance, before one particle even touches another. So it's, it's like, wow. I mean, how far do you have to drive to get to the next 7-Eleven? No. How, how far do you have to drive to get, in this case, you have to drive from the distance from the sun to the earth to even get to the 7-Eleven. Prior to that, you won't see anything, if that makes any sense. That's, um, it gives you an idea of just how, how vacuous space is. And yet, look at all the space weather that comes from it. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. It's because it all works with electric and magnetic fields. That's what the, the, big, the big player in space is electric and magnetic fields. And you don't get radiative, you don't get heat transfer from that stuff nearly as effectively as you do from collisions, from particle collisions. So, how's the ozone layer doing now? Don't know. <laughs> Especially with cosmic rays. Don't know. You have to talk to uh, an atmospheric physicist on that one. But I, it's a very interesting question. Especially in this deep solar minimum, if we can actually measure that. I think there are people uh, who do study that. As a matter of fact, I've read, you know, bits and pieces here and there. But there's just so much to know, and oh, I, I just can't get to it all. Um, but there's, there's definitely been people who've measured that type of thing, and they can see the solar activity cycle. And it's different depending upon what altitude layer you're looking at. So um, more, more space weather effects penetrate deeper down. Um, you know, well, they, penetrate, they, they have really big effects up top, but then as you penetrate deeper down, they get less and less and less. And then the terrestrial weather side takes over, and at some point it becomes a smear and in the altitude layers. I, I cannot wait until space weather and terrestrial weather fuse into a single you know, field and everybody just basically from sun to mud. They, that's a, it's a con continuum of a study. Um, that's not here yet, but it's coming. It's coming and, and um, you know, we just have to be patient. So, Love this class. Thank you for sharing. Oh, you're very welcome, Deanne. I appreciate you being here. I, hopefully it was clear. <laughs> um, good old Maxwell's equation. Yes, yes, absolutely. None of which you will see here, because <laughs> that's not the point of this class. If I do that, people will run away with their hair on fire. I am not going to start invoking, you know, div dot b equals zero and stuff like that. <laughs> it's not, no. Let's talk about a divergenceless magnetic field. No, 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 no. Let's not do that. Um, that's not a good idea here. <laughs> Nikola Tesla, I felt that okay. Um, any other questions? How about stereo B? You know, I haven't heard any new news, but the, the old news I have is that one of its gyros failed. Um, you know, we did make contact with Stereo B a few years ago, and we found that its hydrazine was frozen. We tried desperately to heat up its hydrazine, turn the heaters on, 
turn off everything but use what little battery power we had to turn the to heat the hydrazine and as we tried to test out some of its you know get it to ping itself to see what it's what it's doing uh, we found a gyro failed which meant that we probably were not going to be able to write its attitude and um, and then we lost contact and that's the last I know that we heard from it so uh, even if even if we do manage to re maintain or reinitialize re contact with it, I'm not sure if the spacecraft will be recoverable simply because we can't stop its spin, not with one of the gyros being dead. And if its hydrazine is frozen, and I, I don't know. But we're going to keep trying. People do not let go of their babies easily, not in this field. So I guarantee you people are going to be trying and trying and trying, and it's going to be um, a wild ride over the next uh, probably six or seven years as Stereo B you know, crosses through Earth. And when we have really the strong antenna power to be able to try to try to get a hold of it, um, so you know, keep your fingers crossed. We're, we're going to keep trying. Okay. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm, you know, you got here late. Already enjoying it. Um, go back to the beginning. I mean, this has been a three and a half hour course, so everybody's had amazing questions today. So you've kept me on for so long, and I really appreciate that. I think that happens more and more and more as time goes on. You guys keep asking really fantastic questions and um, I'm, I'm so grateful because it, it just lets me know that I'm not the only one who's super interested in this stuff and you guys are so smart I, I can't believe how incredibly intelligent you guys all are it just it just thrills me every time um, how about getting special guests on your show that can talk in those about those things more in, in, in depth the problem is I can I can talk I can talk about them more in depth and these and other people can as well but this these courses are not meant for that these courses are to be able to bring the public on board and get them to understand that you don't have to be an expert. You can be a non-expert and understand this stuff. And if I bring experts, more experts, more of my colleagues on to, to talk about this first, it took me a long time <laughs> to learn how to talk without jargon. And I, I know a lot of people tell me I make it look easy. It's not easy. I've been doing this for about seven years now. And I can't tell you, even in forecasts today, when I'm doing my forecasts, how I have to stop myself and retake because I'll throw in too much jargon. And these courses have more jargon than my normal forecasts do. So I really have to watch myself. And if I bring a scientist in, oh my gosh, you'll be lost in three minutes because of all the jargon they'll, they'll use. And you just say, okay, well, try not to talk jargon. They don't know how. There are no other words to use. They've never had to use other words to try to describe things. So things will spiral out of control very, very quickly. And so I haven't done that because I don't have anybody trained to do what I do. Um, you know, my job is to, to talk about this stuff without all the scary scientific jargon in there because that's not my, that's not my point. I don't want to scare people off of this field. I want to bring people into this world and get them to feel that space weather is their weather. But it does take a bit of, um, uh, a bit of finesse. And so it's, it's a beautiful idea, but I, I just can't do it. Um, there, there's just nobody you know, maybe, maybe in a while, maybe when I get more scientists who want to do what I do. But most scientists, they want to write their papers, they want to do their research, and they want to talk their jargon. And that's just not what this whole thing is about for me. So, that's why. Um, let's see. For what it's worth, I share everything you publish here to my Facebook. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you, Jonathan. That's so sweet of you. I appreciate that. Yeah, feel free. Feel free to, sh to share this stuff. Um, I just, the only thing I don't share are my charts, uh, at least not right now. A lot of the charts I use, I have collated from other people's work, and especially until I get, make sure that all those charts have, and all the figures have um, their appropriate, you know, ownership captions, I, I really don't want to share the charts. Um, plus, I don't want people trying to talk about them if they don't, if, if they talk about them incorrectly, and then it's attributed to me, and oh, what a nightmare. So I'd rather just take the heat for what I do, and get authors who've created some of these pictures mad at me, when I haven't properly explained them, and it has happened. <laughs> I am definitely not fall or infallible. Um, but then again, I've also had authors say, oh my gosh, that was such a great thing that you did. Thank you so much. So, you know, it goes both ways. Um, but that's, that's the only thing. So share the videos as, as, as liberally as you'd like, but I just won't share the charts right now. Maybe that'll change in time, but not right now. Oh, <laughs> tickle me and I'll hurt you. Tamitha is a national treasure. Oh, gosh. You're going to make me melt right here on camera. How kind. That's so kind of you. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay, Charles, I'll see you. You're on a vacation, so enjoy. My gosh, in the pandemic. 
terrible time to have vacation. I, one of my students had her 21st birthday on Thursday. Can you believe that? 21 stuck at home. I, I, was, I felt so badly for her. My gosh, what, what, you know, what an amazing time to be alive. Okay, you do some, thank you, Ray, I appreciate that. Uh, Scott, thank you so much. Your curiosity, passion, and adeptness for learning and teaching is, all, is a needed, oh, is a needed inspiration. Thank you, Scott, that's so kind of you. Okay. Oh, good, Tiffany. Welcome, welcome to our community. Um, you'll find that not only am I, you know, are these classes fun, but there's a lot of people in this community who know a ton of stuff, and, and they will help you as well. So this whole, this whole space weather community is just, it's just wonderful, and it's growing. And it's going to get even more fun as the new space, uh, the new solar activity cycle really starts taking off. Just stick with it over the next couple of years, and you're going to see a big buzz, big buzz of stuff. Um, and Andra, so your good call sign, HA6NN, it looks like. Yes, cool. i got to get on the air. Um, okay. Thank you. My cat's dead. <laughs> nice name. <laughs> thank you so much, you guys. So it looks like I got all of the... Um, thank you, Tiffany. Um, Oh, good. Oh, look at these amateur radio operators trading call signs. This is awesome. I just love this. See, that's what I mean, this net, the network of this community. There's just so much love in this community, and I, I can't thank you enough. You guys are just, you just inspire me in, in ways that you will never understand. I, I'm just so grateful to be here um, and, and be someone that you guys, you know, want to want to hang around with. So on this pandemic Saturday. <laughs> Yuck, right? Um, but no, thank you so much. And this is why I stay on for three and a half hours now, is because of all of you. And I just really, I just really appreciate it. Okay, so I think that's it. How do we survive the next CME? Easily, breathe. I mean, the next CME is going to be, we just had a CME just, just a couple, like a week ago. It has a gorgeous aurora. Uh, I don't know if it made it down to the United States, but it was in Canada, all over Canada. It was all over... Um, uh, it was all. Over, it was in Scotland. They even had it in uh, in New Zealand. We haven't had it in New Zealand in, for quite some time. Some people got mad at me for saying Christchurch instead of Christchurch. Uh, I used to call uh, Dunedin Dunedin. I mean, I will. I butcher pretty much every every name you could possibly imagine. But yeah, we have CMEs that hit all the time. So just stay tuned because we'll get more and more of them as time goes on. Um, shout out from South Africa. Oh, thank you so much, guys. Audio Ninja. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> right on. I know. I know your work. So, thank you for being here. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah. During Solar Max, talking skip on radio is so much fun. Hopefully, we'll have a decent solar activity cycle this time. I think it's still going to be a low one, but there are some scientists, including Scott, Dr. Scott McIntosh, who believe that it's going to be a bigger cycle than we than we might think. Um, some of his models are pointing in that direction, and if he's correct, I'll be thrilled. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. When are we getting to the Terminator? I know. I know. We, we think we're almost we're, we're so close to it right now. Um, we're seeing evidence that, that of the new bands coming in. When we look at the butterfly diagrams, we're seeing the new bands coming in. So we know we are just inches away. And it's literally that northern hemisphere that's just holding out. I don't know why it's such a prude. <laughs> but if the northern hemisphere finally gets in line, um, then will light up like a rocket, but it's just holding out. Okay, thanks again, Charles, that's so sweet. Um, I appreciate that. Thanks, Jerry, and hey, my battery survived, so you didn't have to text me and let me know of any problems. So, but thank you for moderating the chat, Jerry, I appreciate that very much. Okay, guys, I think that's it. I think I've answered most of the, um... oh, hey, Jonathan, it was in the news, the Aurora was in the news, cool. Uh, we're going to see a lot more of that. So, like, if any of you guys do aurora photography or anything like that, especially as a new cycle comes in, post them on Twitter. I will repost them. There will be no news people in your community, weather news people, who will pick them up like crazy. And what I'm hoping is that with this new solar cycle, with all the eyes on the sky we have now, we're going to show people just how far south the aurora really comes in the northern hemisphere and vice versa in the southern hemisphere, how, how far north it comes. The aurora comes so far, so much further down to ordinary folks, to us average folks at mid latitudes, in, even in just minor solar storms, than I think anybody has any clue of. And I just can't wait for this new cycle to kick in because this community has grown so much, just even over the solar minimum, that when the solar storms really kick in again, 
oh my gosh, we're, we're just going to blow people's socks off as a community. Space weather is going to be a thing, a real thing, a mainstream thing. I just know it. I just know it. So I'm, I'm just thrilled and I'm just like, you know, itching, itching to get started. So, okay. Hi from Wales. Hey, thank you, Stephen. Appreciate you, you checking in with us. And I will shout out from Fort Worth. Um, thank you all from all over the world. You, you really are a treasure. Okay. And I will let you go. Thank you for hanging on for almost, what, three hours and 40 minutes or something. Oh my gosh, way too long. Okay. I'm going to go get myself some tea because if you can't tell my voice is out, I'm done. <laughs> anyway, can't wait till next time, guys. Okay. I'll see you soon. Bye.